on the spot, get the club to pop when I come up with the crop. God, I love it, love it or not. I'm hot from the hop to the club to spot, get the club to pop when I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop when I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop when I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop when I come up with the everybody. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. I'm your boy, MJ. This is your first time tuning in. What is good? How are you? How are you? How you been? The fuck? You ready to get down tonight or what? Because I sure am. But for reals, man, if this is your first time tapping in into the coolest reptile podcast in the world ever, like nothing could, could even compare to this, not even a little bit, for reals, um, hit the subscribe button. Trust me. You'll, you'll thank me later. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, hit the dislike button. Drop me a comment. Um, let the guests know how you like the podcast. Let them know how you how you like the information that they're dropping. Let me know how you like the podcast. If there's anybody out there that you want me to bring to the channel, please let me know, man. I'm all ears. But, yeah, welcome in. Shout out to all my trappers out there. What's up with all the early birds? I will get to you guys in just a second. But you guys know what the deal is. For all the bestest and freshest rodents delivered to your doorstep, that's the one and only Cold Blooded Cafe, baby. And that's not even Cold Blooded Cafe. That's Freedom Breeder. That's Cold, Cold Blooded Cafe, baby. www.coldbloodedcafe.com. $30 flat rate shipping, day one pinks, mammoth rats, you name it. That si All those size rodents can get delivered to your doorstep. Always sales going on. But more importantly, professionally packed rats to your doorstep. Can't get better than Cold Blooded Cafe. So shout out to Cold Blooded Cafe. Shout out to Desiree and Steven. Had a great time. For those of you who follow me, saw I threw a big-ass barbecue for all my trappers, all my trap Patreon members. We had Brian Cusco in the building, Garrett Hartle. We had Desiree. We had Steven. Andrew Acevedo. God, man, we went through some hell, me and that guy. But really fun time with my friends that I had over the weekend. And it was so awesome to meet some of my Patreon members as well. So just want to say thank you to everyone who, who uh, joined in on that. That was an amazing time. Um, and then shout out to what I'm rocking on my shirt right here. Shout out to Ashley and Steven over at Focus Cube Habitats, man. The future of enclosures have arrived. They've been here doing big things. I'm telling you right now, these PVC built enclosures are super light and I'm not concerned about these warping or anything. I had somebody over, um, talking to me about their concerns with PVC enclosures and how they warp. Well, if you don't have anything stacked on top of them, which you shouldn't have anything heavy stacked on top of a PVC enclosure, being that they're so light, but you're not going to have that issue with it being warped. I'm just letting you know right now. Okay. So I got a lot of compliments on my focus cube habitats. I had a lot of heavy hitters over at the trap this weekend. And I, I it was just amazing. The feedback I got not only on the focus cube habitats, but my entire collection. So shout out to the big dog who showed up, man, and gave me some props. You guys are amazing. Shout out to Jesse, the whole freedom breeder crew, stainless steel racks of America, the toughest of the toughest. I'm telling you right now, if you got a freedom breeder rack, you know where it's at, man. Bomb ass racks being built all the time, professional level for sure. Uh, shout out to John. Shout out to Alex over at Sim Containers. I finally got some eggs on the ground, man. Clutch number two just landed. Pretty awesome. Got uh, eggs from a snake that I held back in 2018, my very first clutch. I feel like Will Morrow's in this shit. You know what I mean? I had a held back that I uh, bred, and I got eggs from it. I am so excited. So make sure you go follow me on Instagram and see what the what the pairing was on that. But more importantly, man, my eggs are inside a sim box, both clutches inside of a sim box. All the other clutches to come inside of a sim box. So 
out there, if you're wondering what the fuck is a SIM container, what can it do for me, head over to the website and check it out. I'm telling you right now, simcontainer.com. They are the best, and they've been the best. So shout out to Alex. Shout out to uh, John. Thank you so much for sponsoring the channel. And let's see. Who do we got? Who do we got? I guess we're done. No, we're not done. We have the big dog himself, the ball python game killer, always evolving pythons, always doing big things, man. I just did an amazing plug episode, um, which if you don't know what the plug is, man, I highly suggest you go over to Animal Bites TV and see what I got going on there every Friday morning. Every Friday morning, I'm dropping a news clip on what's happening with the reptile world. Like, what the fuck's going on? There's so many people new into this industry that's coming like every day. Okay. So it's really hard to catch up on things. Well, guess what? I'm going to catch up all you motherfuckers on shit every single Friday morning on Animal Bites TV. So make sure you go over there and check it out. And like I said, I did a sick ass clip uh, for Miguel on his trip over to Mexico. And I want to get your guys' opinion on how you think that collaboration is going to work out. But big things going on over uh, with Miguel. And again, thank you so much for uh, sponsoring the channel, Big Dog. You are a huge motivation to not only me, but the entire industry. Yes, sir. You got that right. Um, and then, of course, guys, please, U.S. Art always needs to fight. Bro, people are not giving up. I'm telling you right now. When I say people, I mean the fucking weirdos out there who are trying to keep us from having these animals that make us so happy. You know what I mean? I get a lot of great feedback about this podcast because guess what? It's all about the animals. So without animals, I don't know where the fuck my life would be. Where would your life be without animals? I don't know. But I ain't going to let no motherfuckers come try to take my animals away. That's that's my piece. That's my, 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 my heaven. My piece of heaven is the animals. Of course, my wife too, right? But... Just saying, man, let's go ahead and try to support U.S. ARC at all costs. Make sure you guys are attending the shows, attend the U.S. ARC auctions. And if you cannot afford, and no one's pressing you to give them money, if you cannot afford to support U.S. ARC, just talk about it, man. Tell people who are coming in how important U.S. ARC is because it's important. They need to know. I'm telling you right now, man. And then um, before I get to the early birds, guys, if you want to get a uh, hold of me, Personally, like if there's something you want to tell me, please reach out to me on Instagram. That's the best way to get a hold of me. That's where I do all my networking and, and you know, customer service. Instagram, baby. Woo! MJ, MJ Exotics Cartel with an A, not an E. Um, and then if you have any podcast inquiries, hit me up on the Instagram podcast page, Trap Talk with MJ Podcast. Shout out to all my Twitch viewers. I don't know how many are out there. I hope it's more than five, but you guys are amazing, man. Let's go ahead and keep pushing the, the Twitch uh, platform. And then I'm also on TikTok. I just posted something on TikTok not too long ago. Please go check it out. Go follow me on TikTok. All right. Now, real quick, this last piece, this last plug out there. All right. Shout out to my Patreon members, okay? My community of savages that are growing by the day. You guys are amazing, but I want to just say out there, if anyone out there who are interested in working with more than just one species of snakes and you're like, man, I would like to get info from all different avenues, go down to the link below, click on the Trap Talk Patreon page. Go see what I have going on. Go see the kind of breeders I have affiliated with this Patreon page, and you will not be disappointed. So much info being dropped. We get together every Sunday for a Trap Talk Zoom session, and man, is it just awesome. I'm telling you right now, you don't want to sleep on it. I'm capping it at 100 Patreon members. We're already at 75. So that being said, if you are looking to be a part of something really awesome, you want to be a part of a trap family with fucking bunch of sick-ass motherfuckers out there who are just on their way, go down to the link below. Click on the Patreon page and join that shit, and you will not regret it. Shout out to my Patreon fans, man. But who is in the building? I am ready to go because I know you guys are ready to go. I am excited. What is good, Klaus Ch Cloud Chaser? Chasing Flavor. What is good? Yeah, man, I'm glad you're here. The homie Angel. Hey, everyone go follow my homie Angel, Reptile Club 310. We got to get this guy to 1K. He's a Trap family member. He's my boy. He definitely deserves to be at 1,000 followers on Instagram. So go follow my boy, Miguel. Uh, Miguel. <laughs> Angel. What up, Josh? Shout out to the homie Josh Fenelin. Josh was just over here at the Trap Barbecue as well. He actually helped me prepare for the barbecue when I had all that drama go down. But Josh, you and Krista are real ones. I had a great time hanging out with you too. And yeah, I can't wait to see you guys again. What up, Reptile Road? A new Patreon member right here. Thank you for joining the family. I'm so excited to have you. Will, what up, Will? Hope you're ready for a great show. The homie Austin Anderson. Big homie shit. What's up, Aurora? That's a Trap Talks uh, Patreon Savage right there. What's up, Mal? Oh, Mauricio! Man, dude. Oh, my God. This is my boy right here. Okay, me and this guy go far, way back. And 
He knew I started this podcast a long time ago, and this fucker has never joined in on a podcast until now. And I knew it was going to take Garrett. I knew Garrett was going to be the first one to get my boy Mauricio Luteroth on here. Mouse, oh, you're the you're the man, bro. Thanks for being here. You know tonight's going to be sick. Uh, what up, Nate Dog? Nate Dog thirteen. Nate thirteen. Dog. What is good? Marlon Joseph. What is good? Trap Patreon Savage right there. Rainy Day Reptiles. The homie Calvin Garcia. Real quick. Hold on. Man, you want to talk about epic? So I, I had one of my one of my my day oneers, right? And Calvin Garcia is a day oneer for sure. But this guy attended the trap barbecue, and he knows I spent some time in Texas. And when I left Texas, I left with a piece of Texas, and then I lost that. And I explained to Calvin how much I missed it. So what did this guy do? He got me cowboy boots. Look at these. Oh, my God, Calvin. Bro, look how official these are. So, listen, you're going to see me in Arlington rocking these bad boys. I'm telling you right now, these might be my boots at every show, just in case I need to, you know what I mean? I might need to stomp something. You never know. Man, thank you, Calvin. Honestly, bro, my dad really wants to jack these, but it's not going to happen. You are the man, Calvin. Thank you so much. And I'm going to end it at that because I want to get going because I'm excited for tonight's guest. Let me take my alpha brain. That way I'm not slipping up on any questions. All right, guys. So green tree pythons, man. You guys ready or what? Green tree pythons is something that's growing popularity along with ball pythons, along with a lot of keepers coming into this. It's like ball pythons. I don't want to say hog noses, but whatever. That is the case sometimes. But then green tree pythons. From what I'm seeing, people are so fascinated with green tree pythons. And what's there not to be fascinated by, right? But I'm telling you right now, once you learn more about green tree pythons, you understand how easy it is to keep them. But everyone, right, seems like eight out of ten people that come to this hobby want to breed fucking snakes, right? Well, guess what? Breeding, breeding, green tree, breeding green tree pythons is no walk in the fucking park. I'm telling you right now. Okay? But with dedication, with patience, it could all work out. But more importantly, I'm so excited to bring this guest on because I've been following this guy for the last three and a half years since my session with green tree pythons started. And this guy has not missed any beats He's on point. He's actually the one who coached my friend Mauricio, who's actually in the building right now, who had an ex beautiful clutch of yellows, man. But without further ado, man, here he is, my man Garrett from the House of Blue, tapping in with us from the West Coast in LA. What is up, Garrett? Hey, MJ. How's it going? I'm good. Oh, it, it's going, baby. It's going. I am so excited. If you can't tell, I'm very excited to have you on the show so tonight. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure, honestly. Like I told you earlier, I really love what you're doing here. I, I love your podcast. You keep it real, and hopefully I can match that energy. Nah, okay. man. Yeah, dude, I'm not worried about that at all, but thank you for being here. I just want to know, how's everything going? You're on the same coast as me, mm -hmm. um, so how's life been? What's 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 up with uh, your end right now with everything? Oh, uh, Let's see here. After the breeding season kind of came, <clears throat> not to a stop, but it slowed down. Right. You know, everything got established super fast. I got a chance to actually focus on my personal life. So right. right now I'm in the housing market as pretty much I've probably told everybody who's in that audience that knows me. Right. Knows that Garrick is looking for a house here in LA and really hates it. <laughs> it's not easy, bro, huh? Being where we're from, bro. Like it's listen, I rep where we're from all the time. When I say where we're from, Southern California, like Southern Cali mm -hmm. is paradise i've been to a lot of spots bro you come you let me show you around southern california and you're not going to be able to argue that there's any place better but paradise costs it ain't easy bro and everyone wants to be here covid did not make any things easier and the reason why i'm i'm, I'm getting hyped up about this because me and my wife are looking for a place too in san diego which is huh. not easier you know what i mean like the same market yeah and it's crazy because you have people out there who are literally willing to bid almost a hundred thousand dollars more than what the what the actual is asking is. Like, there's people with just stupid money out there. Like, I don't know if it's a monopoly. I don't know if they're just you know what I mean. But man, it's it's not easy, but it's still doable. It just it's just not yeah. easy. It's not fun. <laughs> the second you're ready, then the market goes up, and then you need another like two years to be ready again. So you know what I'm talking about, and everyone else now in the audience, like you've already confirmed it for me. Thank you. It's insane. 20% over asking price. Like who, no one, it's just, this hasn't happened before. Now and you is already double. So now I, I don't want to say add it to the list of 
stress that you're maybe used to dealing with. But I mean, am I am I am I off or am I on target when I say that breeding green tree pythons is a fucking stress, like stress yeah. case? Like, am, am I pretty close to that? <laughs> you are not wrong. Let me put it like that. And especially if you're someone who gets stressed easily, just or even slightly neurotic, I guarantee you, you're it's you're gonna need some so sort of meditation, some sort of I, I don't know, like Zach say something, whatever helps. I got, I got a life coach. That's I literally got a life coach, and my life coach is Socrates. Shout out to my boy Socrates. That guy literally walks me through every step now because I need it. Like I, bro, like it's this like this game. I always say teaches you patience, but mm -hmm. there's times where you need it forced fed down your throat, like because yeah. patience. It's either you do the patience or you just lose your mind and you don't have fun. And this is just not fun no more. You know what I mean? Exactly that. And uh, you mentioned Socrates. I, I love Sock. Uh, he's always been amazing. He's actually, I, I was telling uh, my other friend today, he's one of the few people that make this hobby as amazing as it is. Like, <laughs> yeah. honest, he's, he's amazing. And if anyone hasn't noticed by now, he's producing them like by week, by week, by week. Like, it's insane. And some really crazy stuff that you just you won't get anywhere else. Like you don't see it happening. It just it just kind of proves the point of where where patience takes you. You know, you you put in your time, and you know it, it's it's also a huge risk factor because you got to put money into it. Like not yeah. only, not only is it patience, but it's a lot of money. And you know, which we'll get into in just a second. But what I want to what I want to get I want to get to know you more, man, because obviously we're talking about patience and stuff. Did you have a lot of patience as a kid growing up? Um, or like, did, did you learn a lot of this getting into green tree pythons? Like when did the patience things start helping you out? This, <laughs> you know, actually I had to learn patience and it wasn't even the breeding of GTPs. It was until, it wasn't until my first clutch where I had like six or seven that just, it was, they refused to eat at first. Like it was like week two. I was a little bit of a noob. I didn't know what I was doing quite well or right. at all for that matter. And it was because you, no matter how much you read about it and I read about it and I asked everybody annoyed the living hell out of them with questions, but it's not until you're spending two hours on one baby who's you finally get it to attack and then it drops. Then you learn patience uh, until then. No, not, not yeah. at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I am so thankful to the, to, um, you know, I, I'm I'm thankful to a lot of people I've met in this industry. You know, it's it's a lot. There's a lot more beneficial people I met than the negative. I, I will be honest yeah. about that right now, and, and I'm so thankful. But if it wasn't for the ones, you know, and I I've talked about this before, but Andrew Acevedo, he was the one who like literally told me like working with imports, you know, emeralds. If it throws up, that then it, that thing's dead. You know, like yeah. like just and he prepared me for a lot of that stuff. He also prepared me for chondros, but like that pre preparation, like literally taking that stuff to, you know, to consideration when it happened, it hurt, but it was like, all right, you already expected this shit. And in, in Andrew, now Andrew wasn't the only one, but dude, he told me condos are not for the faint at heart. If you have a weak heart, like, dude, you got it. You better just stick to fucking ball pythons or like go, just go an easier route where it's a for sure thing for you because nothing's for sure with condos. I don't care how good you are. Like, it's not for sure. I don't, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like, I don't know. Am I wrong? Like, is there anybody out there who's just like perfect that you know of? Like, who's like, I mean, I don't know. Like, because I just know everyone doesn't share everything, right? So it just can't be all rainbows and fucking like, you know, 20 for 20 clutches. There's clutches that go bad in between. Am I right? You're 100% you're right. It also depends about your, like, what your mindset is with all of this. Because there are people who can take huge losses and be like, yeah, it's like, fuck, who gives a shit? Like, it happens, it happens to the best of us. There are people who like do slight little fuck ups and they'll beat the shit out of themselves. Like, why, why didn't I avoid this? Why not? It's all your mindset, honestly. Like how you go in with it. If you tell yourself, like you know, like I'm gonna give it my best, uh, you know, like because the husbandry itself is not difficult at all. It's not until you start breeding that that's when problems start arising, and the problems are mostly in your head at the end of the day because you don't even you don't know exactly what's happening. Like, 
<laughs> it's weird shit that it throws at you, like really weird shit. Like, dude, you like we are our own worst enemy so bad in this shit, and it's not even the snakes. I guarantee, you, like, if a snake if a snake could talk, it could probably just be like, hey, stupid, like, you know, like, what are you doing? But it's just like we just don't know better, you know. Like, and there's yeah. a list of things that go into factor with that. Um, but you know, before we get too involved with like, you know you know, the feeding with animals, I, I still want to learn a little bit more on your transition into just keeping snakes in general. Like, did you always keep reptiles as a kid or like, what was your thing with animals as, you know, growing up? I think us as reptile keepers, we started off really just loving almost everything. We, right. we loved it all. I agree. Yep. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you're the same way too. And yep. my, my very favorite, probably up until chondros were panther chameleons and I love them. I love the colors. I love the, the whole arboreal life, the prehensile tails and everything. I they I went crazy for them. And I love parrots and things like that. But it was mainly like panthers, I like chameleons again, not regular panthers. Yeah, right. that I used to keep. And uh I, I did that. I, and then I guess it's because of the maintenance on them, I had to kind of stop for a little bit when I got into university. And then my last year I got a, a trio of Brazilian rainbow boas. And yeah, I kept those, but even then my roommate, uh, he wasn't like too big a fan on them. So I kind of, I had to let go of them before moving out. And right the day after I moved out, I got my first uh, chondro. And what year was this? 2018. It was July. So this, July was, this wasn't too long ago. Yeah, it, it wasn't, I didn't get, I am not a veteran in this. Believe oh, it. Holy shit. This yeah, is crazy. Yeah. This just got even more interesting. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So 2018, right? Let's 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 think about this. Where did you come across this ad, or like, did you meet somebody, or where did this first conjo come from? <laughs> uh, you're, you're gonna hate me, but it came on Craigslist. I don't hey. hate, bro, homie. Are you kidding me, my bro? My Mercedes, my very first ball python, seventy five bucks. Okay, <laughs> ball python, and she wasn't the first one, but Craigslist put me on in the beginning, dog. So oh, I, I probably am gonna just be jealous that you came up. But yeah, let's let's hear about it. Craigslist, you saw a green tree python yeah. ad. Go on. I saw a green tree python ad, and I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen because I was debating whether or not I wanted to get an emerald or a GTP because I re my favorite. Probably was not probably definitely more than even blue or black or yellow was dark green, dark green, yeah. solid dark green. Is, was my what accounts Sorry. were you? What 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 accounts were you following during that time that were influencing you to want to get like into condors or emeralds? Do you remember? No, no, no nothing like that. Give me one second. Take your time. Yeah, sorry about that. Is getting a call on the laptop. Yeah, there there were no accounts. Like I was following, I didn't know not a single person. I didn't even know that chondros could be any other color other than green. And I thought that you had to keep them in an exoterra. It was just my luck that the one person I found on Craigslist happened to be very well versed. <laughs> very. <laughs> it was it was literally like a stroke of luck that he told me. You know, like they don't actually do well in exoterras. You don't need a bioactive. Like, so when I got started, I got started right. He told me, oh, go read Greg Maxwell's book. Go read uh, Morelia Veritas. And I went on for a week or something, two weeks, just straight, just kept reading and reading. And then I told him, like, I'm ready. Like, will you be there answering questions? He said, yeah. And I got it. And same, yeah. thing, same thing, Maurice, my, my boy Mauricio. So you so you hear me shout out my boy Mauricio earlier, right? So he he got that book years ago. I think 2015 he got that book, but he like read it back and forth. And I'm telling you, man, like that book is legit, like super yeah. legit. Like, uh, and, and, and if you're good at studying and, and taking notes and really going back to things like, like he is and like you are, like, I'm telling mm -hmm. you, man, like there's, there, it's, it's straightforward if you just listen to how people were doing it. You know what I mean? Definitely. And the thing is with the book, at least there is a lot of stuff in there that is outdated that, we, nobody right, uses right. It anymore right but it's it's a very good template and it the is. thing with i guess you want to say social media is that you don't always know what good advice is because you could ask a very oh, cool you, me? Like this. you get you go you go mi million different directions it's like yeah. it, it makes you sick yeah bro the person and, you love today you'll hate them in a second the second you hear their answer yeah so it, just 
And like, it's nothing against that person because I'm telling you, I have a lot of good friends who are all good at breeding green tri- green trees, but like in their in their own way, right? So I could get I could get help from all these different people, but like, what's really going to help me is finding out what works in my room, like what you know, because it's your demographic. Um, you know, like even just being in LA, it gets probably slightly hotter than it gets here in San Diego. You know what I mean? Like it's just a little difference, you know? So I'm sure you have things mm. dialed into your room, the way your room is dialed in, you yeah. know? Um, but real quick, I want to know who, did, okay. Who sold you the snake on Craigslist? Who was it? Oh, uh, uh, Luke, actually, you might've heard Luke snake Walker. That's his, uh, Luke that's his Instagram snake. name. And then his last name is Myers. He actually just had shot a clutch. So that's pretty cool. He yeah, was having a clutch yeah. back then when I got my first one, I remember. Like, and I just I, I loved it. And to be honest with you, back then I wanted a yellow Neo more than a red. <laughs> so right. it was pretty it was a good time. Like in the dark green look, uh, really that's what captivated me. Like it was just to die for. So So <clears throat> so what 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 snake was this? So the snake you got on it was a female. I'm, I'm assuming, right? No, was it, it was a male. Like I just okay. wanted to keep one. Honestly, I, I didn't want to get like more than one. I'm like, no, this is it. I, I'm gonna get one, and then that's the only pet I'm gonna keep. You know, like if if I'm lucky, I'll be able to keep it a few years because I didn't even know the the lifespan of snakes. I had no idea like they actually can live to 25, 30. Like, right? But yeah, he told me it was undocumented, but it. it uh, import most likely like a southern type or not not most like it was definitely a southern type when i got it i did a lot a lot of research in it because i couldn't tell what type of southern turned out to more most closely match maruke type because i can't ever say for 100 percent. not even with the guys i have here you just can't say 100 percent. like even with a biak there's like six different islands that you know, there's like we call yeah. biak, but in reality like you know, like Biak. There's, so there's so many islands within that Biak island, so it's like you know. Yeah, yeah even Aru. Like, uh, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but there are like hundreds or so of islands down there, or I don't know exactly how many, but I know there's like a ton. So oh, oh, oh we can find know. out. You want to find out? Hey, Patrick. Yeah. This, if anyone knows, it's Patrick Holmes. Okay, um, Patrick. Do you know off the top of your head how many islands are in the Aru locality central or the locality area? If you if you want to drop that, but shout out to Patrick Holmes. I will say, Garrick, you have some heavy hitters in the building. You have Bill Stegel. Um, you know, oh. you have you also have the homie Anders in the building. Where's Anders at? Here's Anders. You got oh. Anders. Yep, Anders from LA, another LA cat, right? Or LA area, right? Yeah, yeah. He's uh Hollywood actually. He he, he lives like a few minutes away. So all right, there's a whole bunch of islands. So thanks Real for quick, that. Uh, I see Patrick's uh, profile picture. That's a sister to Kronos. That, which really? Is you guys probably yeah uh, recognize this girl right that here. One, that one right there. Yeah. Wow. What a trip. Okay, so yeah. let's go back to um, so you, you purchasing your first snake, which was a male, led led to what next step? Like what 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 was the next step after that? Is what I'm curious. Yeah, so I purchased that. I really loved it. The thing was massive. It was like a thousand one hundred grams. Like it nice. was just a beast. Wow. I was like, you know, I, I really, I really love these guys. Maybe just one more. Like, and it didn't really matter, male or female, because I did not want to breed. Like, I, I just didn't have that intention. And I saw another Craigslist ad, and this is where it gets kind of funny. It was for a biak, a female biak, and it turned out to have, or it was a male biak. Sorry, but. I, when I asked the dude, it turns out he had a female and I was like, yeah, like it would be nice to have that option. So I asked him about it and the female was much nicer. It was a red Neo, but he told me it was, it had a lot of problems. It had regurgitated like nine or 10 times just under his care. He was keeping it. Oh, can you, can you hear me? Oh, you can, okay. Yeah. I think I might've accidentally. Clicked. No, no, I'm, I'm lighting my dad, bro. You're good. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was saying that, it, yeah, it had regurged with him like eight, nine times. He had it kept in his garage and he lived in the hotter parts of LA and it probably got like over a hundred degrees at, you know, even at nighttime in the, in the place he was keeping it in winter, it probably got below like 50. Like it was just Terrible. really horrible conditions. Like the thinnest type of plastic, like that, like tub that you could possibly find substrate. There was like absolutely no, hydration like whatsoever in this female like she had stuck shed everywhere she was a wreck and like a complete wreck but 
for some reason I fell in love with that look. Like she was just vicious looking, the orange eyes, like even as a four year old, you know, you guys, obviously, if you're real into Condros, you like Biak because everybody who likes Condros, they love Biaks. Like, you know, the value of them. Yeah. So I, I took her in despite pretty much everyone telling me like, kind of, you're an idiot. Like it's going to die on you. Like Condros are already difficult enough as it is. And you're getting in over your head. It's only been like a couple months that you've had one, like, and I guess going back, I, I would have advised myself the same thing. Don't do it. But I did it and it worked out. I got advice <laughs> uh, from Harlan Wall, actually, uh, how to treat it. And yeah, I added a little bit of my own to that, uh, aside from what the vet told me as well, because my vet had no experience with the green tree pythons. I had to tell her everything that I wanted to do on the snake. Like she even told me there was no paras there were no parasites in the fecals when we know for a fact there were. So yeah, within a few weeks, she was already eating again under my care and not regurgitating anymore. And, and she just started picking up all the weight that she had lost. She was four years old and only 447 grams. So for a, a Biak, fresh input, like fresh import, because I'm pretty sure she was imported as a Neo. That's very small. But e even by any standard, really, like it's 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 small. Like, yeah. But really quickly, she started gaining weight, and now she's the mother of the Womania clutch I just hatched out this year. Gave me seventeen bomb ass eggs. I mean, five infertiles, but seventeen bomb ass eggs. Oh yeah. my god. Okay, so. But what, what's your total count right now with Condros? Like, how many do you actually have right now? The babies included or adults? Let's just talk about adults. Like, let's talk about the, the actual adults that you have. Five. So you have five adults, which is what? Five two, adults. three two females, three right? females. Okay. Yeah. All right. I know it, it might it might seem like I have a lot, but. Only no, no, I mean, the only reason why it would seem like you have a lot is because you're producing a lot. It's a numbers yeah. game, right? Like, it's normally a numbers game, but clearly, with what you have, is fucking meant for this game. Like, you're breeding shit. Okay. So, we'll get into that right now. So, now with you getting the female, right? At what point did you say in your head, like, let me, let me go ahead and breed these things? Or did you collect the other, uh, uh, other pair before doing that? Like, when did you start breeding them? Actually, it wasn't even then. It was about a month after I got her. She had already started eating. She was great. I'm like, okay, like maybe I can tackle something. Like I, I really love these guys. Like I, I genuinely do. And maybe I can, I, I can bring on a couple others. You know, you know when the addiction starts really kicking in, you're like, yeah, maybe another one. It was another one. And back then there was zero knowledge of like Nido, at least for me, like that. It was it. Nobody really talked about it. Nobody really really knew about it like that you know or took it seriously and uh so it wasn't as big a deal like having a closed collection versus like bringing new things in uh yeah anyway a month afterwards i i i found an ad i guess and i i it was for two babies it was like two of chrono siblings and i contacted the guy who, who set me up with the breeder <clears throat> which actually is who I consider my mentor and he's a really good friend and his name is Ed Bradley. It, anyway. Yeah. I, I contacted him. We, we spoke uh, and long story short, it wasn't until after I got Kronos that I was like, no, I have to breed this. Like, it, and maybe uh, for those of you who don't know who Kronos is, he's, I guess the male that he produced my first clutch and he's a uh, Mena and, Let's dip into it. Let's, here, like, let's pull him up real quick. Let's, yeah. I, I have your extra Instagram already pulled up. So um, where, where's he at from? I'm at the bottom, or I should I start from the top? Those are still all I produce, so keep going up. All right, so we'll go up. Right there. Uh, right here. Uh, that one or the – yeah, that underneath that. There you go. Right here. Yeah, that's it. All right. Here he is. So yeah. this, this is the first snake you bought. No, no, this is not the first snake I bought. I ended up selling actually. Okay, you know. when I, yeah, it was the year after that I had bred him, but the uh, female passed away and I'll, I can get into that too. Cause that's also another example of tragedy, like and what 
to expect, not what to expect necessarily, but not to count your eggs before they hatch. Like, but yeah, this is uh, the second male I bought. So yeah, this is the this, this is from Ed, this is from Ed Bradley, right? Yeah, yeah, who bred and produced them. Okay, and how'd you meet Ed? Uh, one of his friends, his name is David, had posted up an ad, and I responded to it, and he said, "I'll get you in touch with Ed." Like, all right, let me talk to Ed. Let me see how he uh, responds to that. And then pretty much he said, yeah, it's okay. He gave me his email. And we emailed back and forth. And it wasn't until, like, probably a long conversation had gone by that he had agreed to give me his number. Yeah, And then uh, it wasn't until a couple phone calls that he had agreed to sell me just the babies. And then it wasn't until, yeah, you, you get the idea. And then I guess we just spoke a little more. He, he just, he wanted to test me to really make sure, like, I knew what I was doing and what I was getting myself into because they, at the time, that was the most expensive thing that I was going to buy. And uh, one thing led to another. He he entrusted me with his mail. Like, I made wow. him a number. He said yes. And he told me he believes in me. And he took a chance on me. And that was that. Man, would that feel? I mean, because I'm coming from experience, and I've I've been told this since joining the the hobby, and I'm telling you, I'll take it to my grave. But what's it feel for you when someone says they believe in you and they hand you over something as dreamy as this? Like, do you recall that feeling? I like it was yesterday, man. You'll never it, forget that, huh? I'll, ne I'll never forget. Like it, it was just. It's not how how often is it that somebody actually supports like exactly what you want to do, and even almost gives up something they love to, to see your goal come true. Like it, it just, or, you know, the thing that you really like, just genuinely like you fall in love with. And that, that for me was uh Kronos. Like when I saw him, like, it was just unbelievable. It's or like an artificial looking blue with yellow and black. And it was just stunning. I didn't think a snake could look like that. And, yeah, I guess him just telling me like, yeah, like I, I believe in you. Like you can do this. It was, it was like a shock. Like I don't even know if I believe in me anymore. Like when you say it like that, you you're know? like, oh, fuck, the pressure's on now. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty amazing. You know, afterwards I even offered him a baby. Like I, like, oh, for like sure, right. you too. Like, but he's not into that. It's pretty funny. He liked keeping cool. all of his stuff very pure. So in one way or another, he kind of told me like he's not into mutts. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> well, the, that's the funny thing. But the thing is, Kronos himself—I don't want to call him a mutt necessarily, but he's not a purebred snake. So th this is the catch twenty-two. Uh, right. Kronos is yeah. Kronos's dam turned out to be a monoquari female, although it was sold to him as a womena. So even like up until. After, even after I got him, I thought he was a pure Wamena male. Like, right. and of course, when you look at the photo, it's almost undeniable that this is, yeah, that's Violet right there, the monochord. This, this, this is a dam right here. Mm -hmm. I, I posted up a more recent photo actually from two days ago, if you want to go to the top. But yeah, it's almost undeniable that she's a monochord, but it's because he was already labeled at, and as. A Wamena, and be yeah, because I didn't want to kind of change that, I kind of called him a Wamena, but also allowed people the knowledge, like allowed them to know pretty much that most likely the dam is a Monoquari, if that made you know any difference. But I don't think anybody really like kind of cared actually for <laughs> what he is. They just cared what he looked like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's yeah. what they look like, you know? I mean, because, you know, shout out to Marshall Mendes, but, like, he said on the show, like, he's a visual breeder. Like, he doesn't give a fuck about the lines or anything. Like, if he goes for what looks cool, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, there's different – I respect yeah. different levels of, like, locality breeders and stuff like that. But for me personally, I want to breed the coolest-looking fucking chondro you could possibly breed, like, plain and simple, you know? Well, I guess – I'll, pu I'll put it very simply too. Like the reason we pay attention to genotype is because of phenotype. How many of you would be following genes to an animal whose color you didn't want to reproduce? If, if you're breeding for color, uh, obviously if you're breeding for something else, like let it be size, let it be body structure, let it be whatever, like temperament even, not that we do that with chondros, but 
if you, like it, if you're breeding for color, then it's the phenotype that makes the animal. Like there is no genotype if there wasn't a phenotype to follow. You know, so now you're getting super geeky with it. <laughs> Sorry. Respect though. That's I mean that's kind of what it comes down to, and this is why I also like started respecting the whole chondro keeping community because like there's people who literally like Patrick, right? You know, we talk about Patrick Holmes, like this guy is so in depth with his knowledge with the green tree pythons, just solely because how much he loves the species, you know, and he knows, knows a lot about a lot of other shit too, but the chondro is like, he's like an encyclopedia. So is, uh, so is Harlan. Right. But like, honestly, all that shit does matter, especially if you really have, you know, I don't want to call it an end goal because there's really no end goal to this, right? I mean, there's always going to be something you create and want to make a better version of, or do you actually have an end goal? Me personally, I, I, I do. I, when I started breeding, I had a goal and it was very like, very plain, very simple, but it was, it's not it, it un, unattainable. I just want to recreate Kronos's look, Kronos and Blue Moon, which is Kronos's father. If you want to pull up that photo too, and yeah. he's, he's in here too. He's, he's in your he's in your yeah. account. I have the whole family. <laughs> oh wow! Let's pull this up. Where he, where's he at? So you'll keep scrolling down. It's all babies. I apologize. Don't don't be. A, we're gonna go through all. There you go. Right there. Right here. Yeah. There you go. <clears throat> all right. So yeah, he's he's the one. Mena. He's the one that he's the reason I named my account the House of Blue because. His name is Blue Moon, and it was kind of like everything I produced has had his bloodline in it specifically. It was all based on this. Like he's the reason why. I mean, I can give I can give the credit to Violet too. Like Kronos is them, but he's the reason why Kronos became the way he was. Like Blue and everything is it led back to him. And he came. Did he come from Ed as well, or did he come from? Yeah, somewhere? yeah, but he's an import. He, he's wow. He's an import. import. Him and Violet are both. Got to be kidding me! This is why yeah. people, this is why people are so reckless with just getting imports. Like he's I, fifteen. Oh my god! And it, okay, did he come in blue like this, or did he come in as no, a? He came in as like a, a wild. The both of them, him and Violet, Kronos's parents, both came in as Neos, and they both came in. Yeah. Do you have and Neo? Pics? Do you have Neo pics of this guy? Okay? I don't actually. I don't. Ed didn't I even have any there. He, he's pretty insane though, but I will tell you this. He was only insane after age like six or something. Like after age six, maybe seven. He, he became a true blue in like at the start of his adulthood. Because even at the beginnings of his, uh, sorry, even at the beginnings of his adulthood, he was one of the most green snakes that you can possibly imagine. Green with a slight bit of uh, bluish wash. And then boom, like that. That's crazy. With, with yeah, bright yellow diamonds. That's so exciting. The, ex, the perfect example of a true blue, I would say. Just oh my god, bro, this is unbelievable, Garrick. I'm telling you right now. And honestly, man, I'm just telling you, like, I feel me personally, like, and this is just me being in my own beliefs, but I feel like stars align for people in this for a fucking reason. Like, there is a goddamn reason why you got set up with these snakes, and. Dude, it was meant to be, and I'm just so happy. Like, this is amazing. Um, but you know, obviously, like what we're talking about, what we were just talking about, like it's not, it's not all fucking, you know, roses and rainbows and shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of licks you have to take in involved when keeping green tree pythons or chondros. So, what are some of the licks you took in the beginning? Like, what are some of the hard lessons you had to learn? Or you could bring up a story of a tragic incident that you maybe recall, whatever you want to do. Okay, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> let's, share let's get some, into it. <laughs> let's share some failures for everyone who says, "Damn, you're lucky." Woo! Damn. Let me tell you some of my failures. So I, I used to have, like I said, my remember my. Uh, I told you guys about the first Maruke male, the one I got, the one that started everything. Yeah, so when you sold. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one. So I had another female as well. It was a Jaya female, and they were the only two yellow neos in my collection. The only two ones, and I figured, hey, this would be perfect. They're both pretty big. Both were like over a thousand grams and everything, and it looked great. Like er everything, like was perfect. And he started cruising, and I decided to pair them up. And this was, I want to say, 2019 or something. Yeah, I paired them up. Immediately, they started breeding. Immediately, she went uh, 
gravid, or at least she went completely off feed, which again, first beginning stages of going gravid. Right. And I come home New Year's Day, or sorry, New Year's Eve, and I see she's on the floor dead. So I, <laughs> I mean, it's a kind of dry story, but I went and got a necropsy, or I think that's what it's called, necropsy, right? When they yeah, come yeah, yeah. Yeah, it turns we, out we, we, paid, we paid about how much for that you that you recall? Which one? The necropsy, the the actual to oh, get. Like, the... It cost ninety dollars, but the actual neck, like the deep, like really detailed necropsy, would have costed probably a few hundred, like three hundred or something. I didn't need it because the second the vet opened her up like this, she knew what the problem was. And what was it? On the day of her mid body swell, New Year's Eve, she had this thing called egg coamitis. And that was when a female, I guess, that when they moved the eggs I, during the mid-body swell. Again, someone in the crowd, you can correct me if I'm mistaken with any of this. Yeah. But, yeah, when they're moving the eggs, pretty much one of the eggs cracks in, and the yolk gets inside her body cavity, like in her bloodstream, and they just immediately die. So, Dude, that is crazy. Bad. I just yeah, had that happen to me. Bad. Huh? I just had that happen to me. I'm not joking. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm not joking. It's depressing. Um, you have I, a body, right? I cut her open myself, though. That's the thing. Like, I actually opened her myself with gloves and shit, and it was pretty intense. But um, yeah, I was very curious on what the fuck happened because I had her paired. Everything was going well. She had, you know, she had the lock. She shut off food. I was tracking stuff, and then I come uh -huh. in, and boom, she just rolled out dead, just like this. I saw and, it. I saw yeah. it. And I cut her open. She had 16 eggs in her, bro. Yeah. I, I think that was around the same number that mine did too, actually. That's pretty 16 cool. eggs, bro. Curly white too, I'm guessing, right? Oh, they, yeah. They were nice. Same here. It, it's tragic, man, but it happens. I mean, I, who was it? I think someone in the crowd, go for it. You can quote them, but they said the fastest way to kill a chondro is by breeding it. I guess, who yeah. Did that? that sounds like something – I've heard that somewhere. Yeah, I think. Uh, but yeah, you're. you're I, I don't know. I, you're right. That's honestly like you know. I don't think chondros deal with stress too well. Like I think them and stress are like a really bad mix where other snakes could deal with it a lot better. You know that's why I feel like the whole Nido thing is such a fucking effect for them because. They just simply don't – their body can't handle it. You know what I mean? Where most snakes that simply deal with Nido can just fucking pursue it and, and push forward. I mean, it's just an assumption. I mean, I, I don't I, – I mean, we could talk about Nido later, but I'm just saying, like, it's crazy how – it's crazy how fragile these snakes become when you start breeding them. It's no joke. Yeah, I mean – uh, as far as Nido, like there's a lot that goes into that. There are different strains and everything like that. And some are just horribly deadly from what I, kn I know and I have asked and whatnot. And a lot of times it happens with breeding stress. Breeding stress is probably one of the biggest stresses, breeding and moving, I want to say, that a chondro will go through. Like it's you can shove a mouse down its neck and it's still probably not even as stressful to them as breeding, I want to say. For some reason, I think something goes on with them their, their bodies go into like overdrive males go off feed females they start engorging themselves on whatever they can and then they completely like stop eating like when they're gravid so i guess it's it's a pretty stressful period for them and in general you shouldn't really ever want to breed anything that hasn't that you don't feel will be 100 percent like fine because either way even if you feel it's 100 percent fine it's never a hundred percent. Like it's, there's always something that's a little like odd, you know, if that makes sense. And it's not necessarily like harmful. It's not necessarily like dangerous or anything, but something that you yourself will like, you'll get into your thoughts. Like what, what did, what, what does this mean? Like, what does it mean that she's grounded or that she's trying to escape her cage? You know, like why didn't she eat? Is she actually gravid? Like shit like that, man. It's pretty, it's pretty like, it gets you in your thoughts. Oh, uh, fuck yeah. Especially if you're like, like, you know, there's people who, who get into this really fast, you know, and like they learn the hard way, man. I mean, you, I've already heard twice since I've been in this of people just losing everything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When I say everything, I'm talking about like 10 plus animals. And, you know, I, I mean, I commend you for having such a like select, you know, small 
collection and you're doing so much with it, you know, because a lot of people have so much just to get what you have, like, you know, and you played it smart, you know, like you just got the right players and, and things just happen to work out too. You know what I mean? Like it just, like I said, the stars aligned for a reason. Um, but if we could kind of get into like your, I want to talk about your experience with you incubating, right? So like, because I feel like where I failed the first two time with my clutches is like incubation, right? Like I, I, kept, I, I was like so focused on having the temps set where they would fluctuate just a little bit. But what was happening with you and your incubation? Are you a straight and bake guy or do you change it? Like let's talk about the incubation techniques that you have. So my incubation technique just goes directly alongside my husbandry and everything else. And it could be summed up with two different things. The first one, keep it simple. The more you're going to, the more variables you add in everything, the more room there is to fuck up. It's, it's plain. It's simple. Like the, the more you're going to add, the more, the more room there is to have a mistake. Like you, you want to add something that you think is beneficial in the end, that could be the killer to your clutch. And the, the second thing is what I like to call the golden medium. That That's more so like with everything, like you don't ever do anything dramatic. Like, whether, whether it's uh, incubation, whether it's uh, cycling, whether it's uh, establishing, whatever the case is, even feeding, never do anything dramatic or like drastic or whatever the term is. It's always at a golden medium. Like you right. never overfeed, you never underfeed. You never over, like put it too hot, you never put it too cold. It's right there in the middle. So my temps are for eggs, right? 87 right. and then I drop it to 85. So it's, it's very basic. It's, there's nothing in what I have done that most of you haven't read already online. Let me put it like that. There's no, there's nothing special. There's no like, Oh, like th this is what makes it amazing. In fact, that probably what makes it special is the fact that there is nothing special to it is that you, you, yeah, it's true though. Like you That's reduce. True. No, it's so true. Yeah, the more you, the, the simpler you make things, the simpler it is for you to control things. And especially if you're the kind that gets stressed out, you're the kind that's very neurotic, you're going to want things to be simple and easy to control. Like, so, so you, you, you want to hear something crazy, Garrett? Hmm. Do you know who Ryan Young is? Of course. Okay, so I had Ryan. On, I had Ryan Young on Unfiltered, um, and he's going to come on Trap Talk soon. I locked that in already. But I had Ryan Young on Unfiltered, and he had talked about how he hit he hit over nineteen different species of clutches that he had. Okay, which is fucking like, dude, what? Like, and we're talking about ring pythons, white lips, uh, you know, you know, southern northerns. Like, I'm telling you, like shit that people just can't fucking hatch. And I was so curious during the podcast, like, how many fucking different incubators does he have like this is crazy bro he has one walk-in like closet room incubator and he puts everything in one incubator and each level of the floor has its own temp does that make sense of course you know I mean? yeah. so it's like wow like talk about simple like you know like he has everything in one like he knows what how high is what temp and he mm -hmm. has shit on the floor all the way up to the top you know what i mean and that's like when I'm like, fuck, bro, talk about not overdoing it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, simple. If it works, the thing is, a lot of times it has to do with, <clears throat> sorry, it has to do with finding what works for you. Cause yeah, it's very true. easy for somebody to look at somebody else, what they're doing or that they're doing, and to try replicating that. But chances are, it might not work for you. Like, especially if it's like a completely different incubator, if it's a completely different environment if your ambient temps are different you know, you know like it, it just it might not work for you like you might it might be the smallest little thing that'll throw you off so finding what works for you and finding it fast it, it helps like yeah yeah yep, that's pretty amazing though like imagine how easy it would be like if, if you just had that kind of knowledge like over here in the room it's 87 over there it's 83 that really is like spectacular that well I, I could tell you what like ryan it's not like ryan's been doing this for a couple years like this guy's been doing it so long and i'm sure he's been attempts at breeding a lot of the stuff for a long time 
you know, he's just somebody who's just dialed in. Like, you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. it, and it's, it's awesome that you say that because just because Ryan Young has a walk-in or closet-type incubator doesn't mean, like, it's so easy for anyone to try and do. I'm sure this guy has done multiple, like, trial and errors with this shit. You know, <clears throat> or it could be wrong. It could be that easy. I don't know. You could try it out yourself and let me know. But I have two. <laughs> I'm not changing anything up. I mean, I've already found what works for me. Like, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. So with that being said, you know, you lost a female that just rolled over. You ended up selling the mail. Now, yeah. let's I mean, without you know, this is no secret, bro. The snakes you have are designer snakes. They are no joke. Like these are investment snakes. Like these are fucking expensive ass snakes. Right. So what 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 allowed you the courage? You know, I'm not saying I don't know how much you spent on the snake, but I just know that it's no fucking peanuts. Right. So regardless, it's an investment, no matter how you well, look. It wasn't it. free. <laughs> it wasn't free, right? You, you know, you, just because you got hooked up on Craigslist don't mean it was $1, you know what I mean? But, you know, that being said, I mean, how much, like, was it that easy for you to just say, fuck it, I'm going to drop the bills on these? Or did, no. you somebody, did you calculate this for a while? Let's talk about that. <laughs> okay, you guys want to know the truth? The well, truth. One, okay, well, one <laughs> – I didn't find Kronos on Craigslist. I found him on Facebook. Okay, respect. <laughs> and everybody, and it's not like there weren't other people who like wanted knew, like knew of those babies. Those babies were there. Like I had responded to that like a couple days later. Like, right. It's, but uh, two, I guess I wanted to also address the designer thing because technically their locality and locality cross. Yeah, and I guess the third is how much I spent, or uh, like in relation to me and how it like affected me. At the time, it, it wasn't that much longer after I had graduated that uh, I had gotten into Condros and then not that much longer that I got Kronos. I had sold my car, actually, to get them. Wow. It, it, I mean, I had sold <laughs> it. Damn, it, that's heavy. Yeah, I, I won't say for how much, obviously. Will, like, you tell me what, will you tell me what kind of car it was? It, it was a convertible BMW. What year? Uh... It was 2007. How many miles? It was a hard, hard top convertible, 328. No, I had other money. It wasn't just that. It was the rest of my savings too. And yeah, so I had literally like ma maxed out what I could. Let me put it like that. What I right. could have had because I just – it was one of those things where you, you see it, you fall in love. Like you just you, – you can't picture yourself not getting it. Like, And I feel like with any right. animal sale – be, even something as simple as an anole or you know a get or like a, a five dollar like lizard that you can get from petco or a five thousand dollar lizard you can get like from uh fauna it doesn't matter do it if you love it like don't do it for the price don't do it for this ask yourself can you go on without this like and if you can't then get it and if you can't and if sorry if you can then it's probably not for you because there are people out there that will genuinely like they will prioritize it. They will prioritize that animal that you don't, you know, and they will be successful with it because they, they genuinely live like they breathe like for that hobby. Like they love it, you know, and I guess that's what Kronos was to me. Like uh, he just I had passion immediately just. You just knew it. Just like it was like it was like it was like a switch. It was like it was like there's no there's no changing your mind. You you were like set. I was set. Like I, I was. I it. Yeah. It, it's kind. Of, I mean, I know that feeling. It's almost a feeling you can't describe because, like, I went from such a drastic change in my own life. I talked about this before, but like, I had a huge passion of wanting to become a DJ. I was like, even though I had a huge problem with partying, I was still getting book gigs, and I like wanted to pursue that and then all that like i think 10 years of trying to become like a, a paid like a good paid dj went from just saying fuck i'm canceling everything and i'm just getting into snakes like and i don't know what it was like it was it was i just knew in my life at that point in time snakes were gonna make me happier and i like i fucking broke up with the chick i was with i stopped talking to all the friends i was talking with at that time literally just like like just changed the fucking script like just and i and i still to this day all I could think about what it was was Brian Barchek's YouTube videos and the ball pythons. And it was, I, I will say that it was ball pythons. It all started with the ball pythons. 
which led to everything else and the and whatnot. But man, it's it's simple. I I mean, it's it's crazy how how amazing that uh, that feeling is that you get. You know. Yeah, it really is. It really when you know, you know. That's when you know, you know. And if you know, you know. <laughs> the catch twenty two of it. And we know, we know. Um, now let me ask you this. Um, you, you know, you establishing babies, right? So we talked to be incubation straightforward right now. Mm-hmm. We, we all talk about like how, you know, there's a luck of the draw with these clutches sometimes. Like you have fucking, you know, little Neos that come out of the egg ready to rock and roll. Fuck, and then you have egg, you know, little Neos coming out of the egg wanting to run away from you and you want to just fucking kill yourself. Right. But <clears throat> How much experience have you had with all that type of like stuff work, you know, and we can maybe talk about your first clutch, how that went establishing those. And we can, you know, go, go from there. No, (laughs) Oh, (laughs) there is nothing that makes you reconsider breeding. Nothing. There, not nothing else, not even failure. You could fail like probably as many times as you want, but there is nothing that makes you reconsider breeding more than establishing difficult meals. Let me yeah. put it like that. There, there's no other bump in the road. There, there is nothing else. That is probably, I want to say, the most difficult thing. And even with one that gets established fairly easy, a lot there is a good chance that right before it was established, it was the most difficult one. And I had my first clutch was, I guess it's kind of ironic, it was my most difficult one. Like it was probably the only clutch I would actually consider difficult. It, every baby took like three, four hours and immediately I'm, I'm, I panic, dude. Like I'm like these little babies, their life is in my hand. I'm going to fuck this up. <laughs> I'm a piece of like, shit. Like, are you kidding me? Like I, I, I came this far, like with replicating Kronos' like DNA only to stop because a baby doesn't want to eat. Like, how do you not want to live? Like, I don't understand. And a lot of it had to do with uh, a prolonged shed, which I heard was like a very rare phenomenon, but somehow it happened on my first clutch. Half of them, it took like a month and a half, two months to shed. And the, half of those, I want to say like six or seven, just because of their shed taking so long, had a closed appetite. <clears throat> it was just hard, man. It was two, three hours trying different things. Like you try all different kinds of ovarian feathers, like any bird you can think of, you went to Petco and you asked for like feathers to them. Uh, you try like scenting, you, you try these like weird ass things that you would have never like thought of yourself. You're asking everybody and anything. You're putting your humility and pride aside because you know what? The animals come first, you know? <laughs> and you're asking yeah, everybody. Sure. You have recommendations like 12 a.m., like 1 p.m. It doesn't matter. You're asking whoever's willing to answer, you know? And it's it's just random and then one day like one of them just snaps and wants to eat and it never like refuses again and then another one like maybe it takes a little longer but i want to say one difficult baby is the equivalent of is probably even harder actually than having a good size collection one difficult baby and that's not even including like the amount of times they shit like once like probably every day sometimes even twice when they're young but it was difficult and uh, especially me, I didn't want to have to get them on pinky heads, but I kind of had to. So a couple of them were raised on that. But immediately when they started eating, boom, they caught up to the sibs. And then this year, I guess the three clutches I had, it went from being like light kind of like with difficult eaters. They weren't so difficult as they were like the, the time before because I still had like probably six or seven that at first – we're, we're playing games with me and, you know, you still, you cuss them out, you do whatever you have to, you know, like while you're trying to feed them and then they just snap and eat. And it, when you look back, it's like, oh shit, this actually only took like one month or one and a half months. This wasn't long at all. And then the clutch after that only took one month. And then the clutch after that, they were, there's not a single one that refused for me in that clutch. And that was the biggest clutch I'd ever hatched. It was a repeat actually oddly enough to my what do you first know? One. and it was a retained sperm clutch too just fun facts for everyone 
Well, I mean, listen, the facts are just coming in, and I would hate to stop these facts and go to the Patreon page. But let's get, let's get let's get the likes up for my man Garrett because my man Garrett's barely scratching the surface with his with his heat of knowledge. So if if you're out there liking this, but you haven't liked the fucking the actual podcast yet, you're fucking up because I will take this easily to the Patreon page where everyone's ready to rock and roll. Anyways, all right, let's get them likes up, please, for the homie. But Garrick, I w- you were talking about your neos that were taking so long to shed out, right? And I'm sure that was stressful for you to go through. Okay. But I've heard about people attempting to offer their Neos meals prior their first shed. Have you heard of that or have you done that at Always. all? Always. Always. Tell me, tell me more. So on your first on your first clutch you did? So yeah, many of you may know actually that uh, I record the weights to all of my Neos. Like I, just from the moment they're born up until I, I want to say like even now. But th- this year I kind of had to slow it down. Anyway, I wanted the ones that ate before a shed for some reason, they, they just grow bigger. Like I, I don't know what it is. I think maybe their metabolism gets started fast. Maybe they're just they were just naturally big to begin with or naturally more accepting. But I always offer them before they shed. Like I want to say a week afterwards, like a week after they're all in their tubs, everything, I just go through it. I don't put too much stock in it. Like I don't spend hours trying to get each one to eat. But it is pretty important because a lot of times the ones that eat prior to the shed, they, they establish fast. But then the reverse of that is if you can't get them eating sometimes prior to the shed, it, sometimes it can cause problems after they shed when they want to eat. It's, it's a very odd situation. It's something else I've noticed is that a lot of t- if you went a little aggressive before the shed and they refused, it's going to be even more difficult after the shed. Whereas sometimes when you wait, I guess, I don't know what it is. I think maybe they have a lot of yolk in their bellies. Like, because right. all of them had that absorbed mostly. I mean, there were still some that didn't, don't get me wrong. But I think they're still eating it. They're still digesting it. And they need time sometimes. And they, they might not want another meal in them. So a lot of times it does help to actually wait until after the shed. But I always offer it, always. Because the ones that eat before the shed, they take off. They really take off. Now, let me ask you this, okay? Because there's obviously like a threshold. You don't want to sit there too long and try to get the snake to take. So what's your like limitations? Like what do you do? Like what do you look for? Like, you know, if you have a snake that hasn't shed out yet and it's kind of acting shy, do you pursue to try to agitate it? Or do you just say, oh, fuck it, I'm going to just like wait. Like what Like what are your attempts on this is what I want to know. So prior to the shed, I never do anything like, like really like – uh, annoying to them like I never really annoy them with the food I offer it if they want they can have it if not that's okay but either after the shed or around probably three to five weeks I want to say uh, it really depends uh, closer to a month time even if they haven't shed I'll still like then I'll start really like being annoying with it because you never know sometimes they just take long but it really it really does help sometimes to be aggressive with it some of them really will only ever respond to you being aggressive, you know, and others, it's actually the exact opposite. Like they will never respond to you being aggressive, like never, n- like you have to be gentle with them. And that right. was something I realized until my later clutches, like that it's not always like that they're going to respond it, like beating them with it. Cause a lot of times I did get responses. Like you annoy them until they're like, fuck this, I'm eating you, you know? <laughs> and right. it, it's a, you have to just kind of, be able to tell with that snake like how are they responding to your aggression how like a lot of times when they slow down like i don't know i think maybe slapping them with the pinky a few times gets the blood flowing or i don't know what it does exactly but they slow down they get a little tired after you work them and they don't want to drop it anymore they 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 eat it like what it's in their mouth after that one strike and they eat it and other times like you need to go gentle and they'll gently like eat it it's it's very weird but they have they each have very like specific like personality traits too like it's you have to know how the snake is moving like uh, and that's when the experience kind of helps with like they have uh spots on their necks uh, like i'm sure you know that like yeah. spots on their necks you kind of tap you know and they really respond to different types of scenting and whatnot like i want to say the only one that's worked for me the only scenting has been chicken scenting chicken feathers 
And uh, it, it's been amazing, actually, very amazing. I don't know if it's the actual scent itself or maybe it's the fuzziness that really tickles them, but it really does work. And yeah, and the smell of the mouse on top of the smell of the chicken or whatever it is, it, it just it makes for a hungry snake. So, oh, okay. Now, when you're talking about the chicken, like, is it an actual, like, a baby chick or is it an actual full-grown chicken? A baby yeah. chick, right? It's fuzz. It's, it's, it's not a feather. Never use the feather. I oh, use like the, the chest, feather. like the stuff on the chest. Anywhere, right? anywhere really. The, the newborn chick will have it or even, like, a day old. The so not, they'll have fuzz on the back of their neck or whatever. There's no, like, one spot on the chick that's going to make more of a difference than another. I feel like texture has a lot to do with it, too, I, I think. Do you wash the mouse off at all, or do you? Um, no. Nope. Did you? Okay, so straight up, just just chicken feathers on it, and then. Boom. I tried it. Believe me, I've had difficult neos where, like, I I spent like almost like not almost like entire days on like neos and stuff, and I have not found like any help like for washing it. Like, in fact, if anything, it's actually been more uh, harmful than helpful because that same snake that I tried washing the pinky when I presented it with a new pinky with smell and the chick fuzz it took and right. that's not because and that's not only because like oh the new pinky was warm because i i always keep like a a cup of really hot water next to me dip it in and then you know give it another shot like every time you close the tub you know so right wow that's and, and then like i i also hear a lot of I mean, have you had any neos that just didn't take until they got to the point where they could take a fuzzy or something moving around Hmm. No, but I uh, I did hatch out one that to this day is like probably the just it, it doesn't necessarily like want to eat. If I don't know how to explain it, like it's like a year and a half. It's no two years old now, and it, it's over two hundred grams. It's not with me. I gave it to as a present to my girlfriend because I couldn't handle it anymore. Like it just wasn't worth it. Like I don't want anything in my collection. Like that's. That, that already started off problematic, you know, because especially now with like starting a new like kind of like breeding program and everything, you don't want to start it off with like things like that. So I gave it to my girlfriend to keep as a pet. And to this day, like it still requires like anywhere from five to 30 minutes to get it to eat, like sometimes even an hour. Like, And, and, we're, and, we're, and, and it doesn't it doesn't take um, live like easily like it has to be so like tired once but it hasn't really worked for her like it's been two years dude like if it was gonna eat it should have happened by now like and it does like and how old is she who the snake the, the female we're talking about she's a little over two she was part of my first clutch probably one of the prettiest too like as a neo yeah so, yeah, yeah. If, okay so my my one and only neonate which is i shouldn't be alive at this point but it is but i okay. sent it over to yeah, El Chapo 2.0. I sent him over to Socrates because I was like the, the whole like force feeding thing was like really like it wasn't getting to me. But like he was like, yo, ship it over here and I guarantee this thing will fucking strike because it wasn't even striking for me. Let's just say that. OK. But anyways, I you know, that guy, you know, Chapo gets over to Sock and it starts striking for Sock. But to this day, this motherfucker still won't eat, bro. Like he's still not eating. But Sock wow. being Sock being the fucking, you know, the, the master mind fucking force feeder that he is or however he does it. He's just good at it. You know what I mean? Man. Yeah. He, he gave me a lot of advice, actually. It's, you know, it's funny you say that. A lot of the advice that I got, like, in, especially in this last uh, clutch or, you know, it was the Womaniac clutch. I remember he, he gave me really good advice and it worked. Him, Patrick Holmes, they like, yeah. really good. it just worked. Like immediately like they uh, like i want to say like half of the ones that didn't want to eat just ate that same day like after uh, you just took the advice and it's just really nice you know sometimes when like uh you just it, it happens out of nowhere like you just listen and it just boom like just works yeah. out you know and it, it was the chick feathers and uh how exactly to prepare things you know and and he told me i believe sock himself told me like try in the daytime like don't try at night and I did, and now all, all my babies are daytime feeders. So that well, was, was that like was that like a morning, afternoon? What what time of the day was that for you? Any time when there's light outside, pretty much. Any time when there's light outside, I mean, they'll eat at nighttime too, but they all respond during the day, which is most convenient for me because you know, with work and everything like that, you want to like quickly feed them and you know, 
they should ask out the door to work or whatever. Yeah. Fuck, dude. So with your first clutch, how many did you end up selling versus holding back? Mm. So with my first clutch, I want to say I sold four as Neos, right? So I kept 10 and I gave one as a gift to my girlfriend and I waited until they were yearlings. I sold two more. Okay. So that became two, three, seven. I had seven left, right? And then when they were a year and a half old, again, I sold two. And then recently I sold another two. So I'm down to three. three. And again, a lot of it has to do with the limitations that I have in my room. I mean, there are many reasons why, but I've run out of corners in my room. I keep them in my bedroom. My family hates snakes. They're terrified by them. Like, <laughs> almost, almost even disgusted by them if like if you want to speak candidly so they're like you can do whatever you want we don't want to see it <laughs> and i guess I feel you. especially now with 52 that hatched though like i want to say half of them like i sold out of necessity right i, I need a new I, I need to move out like it was going to happen next year but i need to move up the process because I can't, I can't breed another clutch in my room. Like I just don't, ha I start cutting into the corners, like into the middle of it. And these guys especially are growing rapidly, very rapidly. So do you have some of your holdbacks in your Instagram account? Or are those some of the ones in the bottom here that we could yeah. look at? Yeah, yeah they're, they're there. Let's look at some of, uh, let's go look at some of, uh, let's go look at, let's go look at the dream. Let's just say that. Cause this is just fucking, I don't even know. I'm just saying, man, this is just so amazing here. So let's scroll up to the top these right are here. Uh, them but they're older pictures so they've, they've changed it quite a bit since then but this is the, yeah i'm down to, i'm down to a little before and after so this is what they look like at what age how old were they here one uh, year four months they were probably like a year and a, yeah a year and four months it says right there okay and yeah. then and then now you're saying that these these are up top now now we can look at these so raspberry yeah raspberry angel and neptune i kept the 1.2 group and again i didn't keep them solely based off of you know oh my god right? look at this shit you gotta yeah. be kidding me She's oh like, oh my god bro what the fuck all right and this one is who this is uh neptune yeah. wow. all right so let's go are they at the very very top mm -hmm. all right here we go it's funny actually the one that you like the most was probably a very average looking uh neo in the clutch so this one right here no the one next to that this one that one too but the one you're, yeah that that's okay, but cool. we'll start with this one so this is neptune oh wow so this is current yeah. pick of neptune he's two years old yeah i need to take a good photo of these guys in some overcast lighting but in general it, it looks pretty similar to that it looks exactly like that actually it's just slightly more blue i want to say oh yeah this God. is angel she's pretty big actually she's in the mid 500s and she's two years old so yeah. Oh my lord! And this one right here, this has to be the banger for me. Like, just look at that tail, bro! Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. What That's the? Fuck? The so, so this is not considered a designer, or is this now considered a designer? It, you know, honestly, a lot of the terminology is just based off of like what you want to call it. Because at the end of the day, oh, yeah. there's no set, yeah set definition on what it is. Someone thinks that. Oh, you need to like a locality cross in itself is a designer. Another person will tell you like the second it's inbred, it's, it's a designer. The second, like, or another person will say, if it's an extreme phenotype, it's a designer. I don't really get involved with the terminology. Cause again, people take it very seriously. Like, Oh, like what, what's blue line, what's designer, what's considered a line. And it's just, none of that actually helps towards your breedings, you know? So I just, I call them my locality crosses, like they're blue Highland locality crosses. I mean, those guys are not quite blue yet, but I think the female next to them will, will get there. If anyone has a problem with it, I'm calling this a designer all day, every day. Cause I feel like designer to me is a special high end quality of something. And that's exactly what this is. I think so whatever, you know, this is my, just my thing. My, my it's fucking amazing. This is just what it is. Thank you. So, Thank you. God damn, this is so dreamy, man. Um, and then, okay, so now the uh, raspberry. Wait, this one is raspberry. This is is this a female or a male? That's a male. It's, it's a male. Okay. But the majority of the clutch was female, actually. So wait, say that again. 
The majority of the clutch was there were like ten females in there. But um, your hold your hold back Angel and Neptune are air females or yeah, is they're females. Nice, bro. What a nice group to keep. Thank Solid. You. And you've kept, you've kept tabs on the others, the ones that you've let go, and how they look. They're, they're, I love them. I mean, but hey, I'm biased. Like, I, if I'm <laughs> interested, I'm gonna say I love it, and I genuinely do. Like, like. All right, I have a question for you, Garrett. Let's hear it. Cool pick. Now, I'm assuming you're just a helping with a little bit of assist uh, stuck shed. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Now. Are you somebody who sprays their snakes or do you not spray Hell their yeah. snakes? Hell yeah, I spray my snakes. Uh, Let's talk about this real quick because, man, I'm such a believer on how spraying does not kill your animals, okay? And there's people out there who refuse to spray because they say that's how you kill a chondro. That's not true. I mean, it depends where you live, you know, and w what the weather is. But what's your take on hydration like versus, you know, like spraying and, and whatnot. And, 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 and tell me a little bit about that. If you don't mind. Okay. <clears throat> so when it comes to it's what, what, what's the, the fundamental argument, right? The hydration versus, uh, what was the other one? Um, hydration yeah. versus, uh, humidity, uh, humidity. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was another word that started with H anyway. I, I think they go hand in hand. Like, I don't know why there's even an argument. Like a snake needs both of them. It needs clean water and it needs to have like decent humidity. It, like, that, yeah, I guess that's what you say. It needs decent humidity and it needs clean water. Right. Spraying becomes a problem only if there's a lot of bacteria. As in, if, you, if you're not keeping your cages clean, if you're, if you're leaving like shit on the floor, on the perch, whatever, yes. Water and heat will multiply your bacteria. It will, especially right. at those temperatures. I mean, yeah, and that's it, primarily what could cause like scale rot or whatever the case is, but you need both. Like it's a lot of times, especially especially with the younger ones, and you'll see it like very easily. If, you, if you're not like overdoing it sometimes, you'll get a bad shed. Like I, I spray, when a, a snake is going through a shed, I spray it every day. Like yeah. at least once a day, like, and they've all responded well to it. I've never seen any problems. And I think it's, I don't know who came up with the whole, like, oh, like if you spray it directly, it lowers their body temperature. Like, like well, somebody, I'm not going to say any names, but somebody pretty big in the, in the con conjure community swears by not spraying because it made their animals sick and they got sick. So, you know, it is, it's, it's being, it's being I don't with it, but who came up with it? That's what I want to know. Cause yeah, I don't it, know. it's people think they're not porcelain. They're not made out of glass. You're not, you're not going to break them by spraying room temperature water on them. You know, yes, there are ways to, to keep them without ever spraying. I let me be the first to say, there are many ways to keep these guys, but yeah. there is nothing wrong with spraying either. Like there's nothing wrong with spraying. And frankly, like you need spring as well as clean water. Like you can't just leave shitty water in there and expect, you know, the, the shed to go well just because you sprayed either. I mean, uh, yes, a lot of times they will drink it off their coils and can't have a good shed. Don't get me wrong. But either way, I pay a lot of attention to that and the quality of water. I think that's a very fundamental thing that a lot of people might skip past, but it's, it's crucial. Now, when you say quality of waters, do you not give tap water to your chondros? Never. Not anymore. I used to. And it's not that it's detrimental. It's not that it's going to kill them or anything. But I did notice, especially uh, I want you, the female I was telling you guys about, the one that had egg comitis, before that, I noticed it on her when I was giving her tap water. Her urates were coming out with crystals in them. And then I noticed it with some of the other chondros too. Like there was a lot more crystallization. And maybe it's just the quality those little, of the gold, those little tiny gold things. They, I, I can't explain it. It looks like like it's maybe it's like rock, or crystal. I, I don't know. It looks it's like, like Molly. I'm not gonna lie, it looks like Molly. I don't know if you know what Molly is, but I mean that's fucking what it looks I like. I've never seen it, but uh, I mean, like, I'm I don't just, know. I don't know. I know what you're talking about though, because I had yeah. I had somebody who I got a chondro for. And they sent me a picture. They're like, hey, have you ever seen this before? And they zoomed in on a white piece of urate, and there was, like, crystals in it. And yeah. I haven't really noticed it in mine, but I, I'm not saying I, I, I haven't had it ever, but that's crazy. Anyway, so what do you think that does? Like, what do you think those crystals are doing? Or Because, or, we, I mean, we're in California, so we have more iron in our water. That's why I, th that's why I always thought 
our tap water was okay for our snakes due to the iron calcium or whatever that's in it. It's okay, but it's, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to kill them. It's definitely not, but it does put more, like, wh why not make it better? You know what I mean? Like, no, I agree. No, I 100%. This is the first time I ever heard this, too. Like, I always thought, like, I've always told California is okay to use. Like, I just, you know. It so is. It is. But e either way, like, I, I personally, I really genuinely loved and can swear by RO water and spring water, which I, I alternate. And it, I don't see crystals. I, I don't see anything. And it's more so what the crystals kind of implied for me. You know, like that if there are crystals like that, chances are their liver is being worked more than it needs to. Like, you know, oh, and especially with the way we feed in captivity, no matter how light you're feeding, you know, you know, you could be one of those guys that really feeds light, but you're still feeding more than that snake is going to eat in the wild probably. So, so you're saying pure, purify, you use purified water, I'm assuming then, right? Yeah. RO water and spring water. It's just that simple. Sometimes it I mix it. Sometimes it I mix it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't take it that seriously. Like, when you know the quality is good for both, it doesn't make too big a difference. But I do prefer RO water, especially if you're... What, hmm? what is RO water? Sorry, I'm, um, I guess... You're purified. The ones that you put, like, right by your sink, you know, and, and you drink oh. out of it. So RO, yeah. and then, and then and, and what was the other one? RO water and what? Spring water. Like, spring water, like crystal geyser and things like that. Okay. And so you're saying you don't take it too serious, but you give them both of it. Yeah, like I, I generally generally prefer purified and filtered just because it's there are less minerals in there. But those minerals are they are essential. Like I mean, they're not as a, or sorry, let me rephrase. They're very helpful. Like I mean, I I don't quite know off the top of my head exactly what each little mineral does and like how it does it, but they're definitely taking those things in the wild. You know, and now you're providing the, those minerals from the wild without like parasites in the water, you know? Oh my God. Oh. Dude, you want to know who else does this? And it confused the shit out of me at first until I like processed it. But Patrick Holmes, we mean Patrick had a long ass conversations, uh, conversations, a long ass. We've had conversations with an S, but we had a specific conversation about why he doesn't, you know, give his Neos just any water like he it's like ro with spring water and i thought he was crazy i was like dude this fool's nuts bro but like he's knowledgeable he's, he's so knowledgeable cool. that's patrick like god damn the guy's so dreamy but dude it makes sense like and this is this is you're finally the next conjo breeder to bring on the show who tells me he does ro in spring water like that's for different purposes honestly the, the ro just gives them the extra minerals Sorry, the, the spring water gives them the extra minerals. The RO, they will digest the meals faster on it. That's pretty much like the, the number one like thing for why I like RO so much is they digest food faster and cleaner. Like when, especially you'll see the difference if you feed like a rat to your female or something a little more easily than you'll see the difference on a, a mouse because mice are pretty a lot easier in general to digest than rats. But you'll you'll notice how much faster they'll digest it. It's just it's just, yeah. Wow, man. So all right. Where do you get your water from? I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. sick. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I mean, the respect on that, man, because like I said, there's a reason why you have the healthiest. I mean, you have not the I mean, just saying your animals look great, like they look how a chondro should look if everything's going right with it, you know, and, and knock on wood, you know what I mean? I'm just saying everything looks great so far. Um, you know, and the whole water, you know, system, you know, like I said, it's not the first time I've heard this and you know, yeah, it's just, it can be confusing. I know there's people in the comments out there that are also like, Whoa, what the fuck? Like, but seriously, like this shit all comes down to just being beneficial with giving the best for your chondro, you know, baby or adult, this, this all makes sense. Um, yeah. And it also makes sense too, you know, for, you know, if it's going to be good for them, it's going to be good for any other snake you keep too, right? Oh yeah. hundred percent. I mean, I, I personally only keep chondros though. That's, it was the only thing that I truly, truly fell in love with. Like I love right. like almost every species, like, I mean, almost every species, but. Okay. Give me a species you don't love. Let's hear it. I, I don't want to insult anybody in the crowd. <laughs> 
Okay, I'll, I'll go first. I'll go first. Hog noses. Hog noses are uglier than shit. You go. Uh, I actually don't know the name, but it's it looks like a worm. I, I can't describe it. Like there's rosy there's, boa, a rosy boa. I I don't know the name. It, ha- it the, their pupils aren't snake like either. They, they're circular. Oh my god! Like, it kind of looks like a worm to me. For example, snake. Oh, but if everyone wants to know what the first snake I had, it was a ball python, and I love ball pythons. Let me put it like that. All right, cool. That's I was cool. gonna say, you know, don't, 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 don't even talk shit about ball pythons because we'll lose ball like pythons. half the viewers. I love, you know, whose videos I really love too is uh, Brian. I believe you said like with the cutting, and same with uh, Jay and his uh, retics. I think that those videos are just captivating. Like, you know, and they cut them open and they see like all these different colors, and it's like Easter. I don't know. It's it's pretty amazing. I'm not going to lie. And and what's crazy is how, like, you can never be, like, like you. I mean, you're always surprised now, bro. Like, you could never be like, oh, this again. No, every year somebody's coming out with something crazy. The which world's is, first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, people hate, like, oh, it's world's first. Well, fuck, don't be mad because you ain't making them. Like, if so, you know, like, I feel like people are, like, against that terminology, but it is what it is. If it's a one-of-a-kind snake, it's a one-of-a-kind snake. Like, yep. and if you're not making it, then you're not making it. It mm-hmm. kind of goes back to the designer thing. You know what I mean? Like if I have two different locality snakes come out with the snake, like Kronos, I'm calling that motherfucker a designer. And if you have a problem, you know where I'm at. That's it. Plain and simple. But like, it's all preference, you know? And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, no one should really get upset about why someone likes what, or why someone names something, unless it's like, I'm sure there's a line you can't cross, right? Like, you know, you don't call, you know, you know, you Okay, let me ask you this. I have to ask you, bro. Ye- Yellow Neo, Red Neo. Honestly, man, do you feel like the potential could go good either way? Or do you feel like Red Neos really do reign king over the yellows? What do you feel like, honestly? Mm. Okay, so this is one of those controversial questions. But I'm, I'm going to give you, like, the, the exact way I think about it. I'm not making this politically correct in any sort of way because – you know what? With you, everything is unfiltered, right? So let's, exactly. let's yeah. I actually love both. I, I really do. Like I, I mean, there are yellow kofiaws that you go insane for. There's arus that you go insane for. You know, maruke's you go insane for. Like one of my favorite looks was a yellow neo maruke. Right. However, I I do, and I am still under the impression that they both yellow neo versus red neo. They are more useful in different projects if that makes sense. Like I, I, I truly, for example, for me, I, I, again, for me, and I would love to see like people, yes, try the projects that they are passionate about. But for me, I think, uh, red just makes, uh, genetic blue easier. Like I'm, I'm not, again, the bluest chondros always to this day have been hormonal blue and probably specifically hormonal blue arus. They're probably the most hormonal. But in my opinion, I, from what I've seen, at least, the, the stuff that have come out of the wild that you can probably, like, with a more educated guest, say that this isn't hormonal and it's not scarring of, like, UVB or whatever, they have been red neonates. And, yes, we, the blue on yellow, ha- <clears throat> their dorsals have been – there are – for like a majority of them, they are very strong blues. They really are. And a lot of them do carry like a strong blue wash. But me personally, I mean, I haven't personally seen a super blue that's been a yellow neo. I don't hate yellow neos. I love the yellow neos. I love red neos. It's just the project that I have embarked on has been re- like it revolves around red neos. That's just. It. Well, let's see. Let's see if he, this. Let's see if this guy even produces any red neos. Let's look at his page real quick. I don't know. Let's see. Why would this guy? Oh, okay. Here we go. Jesus Christ! Look at this lineup right here. Wow, bro. Oh man. Let's just take a minute here. Now this is from this is this is from this. Is this the second or first clutch of the year? Third. Third this clutch is- of the year. It was a retained sperm clutch too, actually. Oh my, you, you sick bastard. Yeah, it was, wow. that was just like an extra like kiss like, from God. Like, you know, there you go. A, a bonus <laughs> a bonus clutch. You got to like them bonus clutches. Yeah, the biggest one I've ever hatched too, actually. It was, 
Oh my god, look at this, bro. Okay, so this this right here, this is from a week ago. This is from the third clutch, you're saying, right? That uh yeah, the third clutch. Okay. Yeah. And and are these all different? Oh yeah, they, they all have like they're similar in the sense they have yellow diamonds, but they're all different. Look at this, right? And this is a holdback, I'm assuming, right here, right? Uh, I trimmed down as much as I possibly could. Like I, there's no room for me to go anymore, at least until they've like changed and stuff. Like can we can we talk after this, me and you? Hell yeah, let's talk. <laughs> but anyways, this is just I'm obsessed with this. Okay, so this is from clutch number three, um, which are all eating fine, right? Like, how was this clutch establishing? <laughs> Dude, this was like this was oh the my most god, look at this thing. <laughs> Fuck dude. Yeah, they're big, dude. Not to mention they were born huge. Like oh my god, dude. Especially big. But they established amazingly. They all they didn't hesitate, like not even once on the first meal, just immediately like this. Ate for me. And then the second meal, they actually almost half of them took large pinkies and they started eating large pinkies. Like so right now they're on small fuzzies too. Like they're, they're big. Dude, so they're on small fuzzies. They're oh, too man. This is so awesome. And so when yeah. you say the, the retained sperm, so this one didn't get paired at all this year? This is it from- did. Oh. It, it, got, it got paired in August. Okay. And, then not, and then it got paired and paired and then she started just not wanting to breed with Kronos anymore. And a few months went by like that where she's just she's she's looking like thick i'm like okay this is good this is good but she's still eating and then there comes a point where it's like okay could she like she stopped eating i'm like she looks obese she looks obese so i i mean i i tried soaking her nothing i i put it in an egg box in there in november and she went in the egg box and didn't come out until january when i pulled her out january 18. i pull her out i put her back in nothing then February, I think again, like the beginnings, nothing. And then I put her into soak because I'm like, she's she's looking pretty fat and she hasn't defecated yet. And then while she's soaking, I see she's getting huge. I'm like, shit, that's it. Like something burst inside of her. Like she's done. Like like, and then she keeps swelling and swelling. She had an ovulation that lasted three days. It was huge, huge. And then afterwards, she went back down to normal. And so the whole time that I thought she was overweight, it turns out she was just, it was like an overly extended, like follicle maturing period or whatever you want to call it. But right. four and a half months went by since the last time she was paired to Kronos until she ovulated, which is quite right. a big deal. Yeah, because every other chondro has only taken three weeks total for me like three weeks, 21 days, 20 to 25 to be specific, every other chondro for, from the very first lock until uh, until they go off feet. So this, okay, so what you're saying is the last lock before she ovulated, ovulated was four and a half months ago. And, was, in, uh, yeah. and in that but, meantime, in that meantime, she stopped breeding. She wanted nothing to do with the males. What she stopped what breeding, she, yeah. She only ate every now and then. And she stopped eating in November, yeah. went down. And, that and was she started it. soaking. No, she went down in the nest box and just oh. chilled there for like, I want November, December, and half of Jan a little more than half of January. Yeah. Okay. So when did you throw the nest box in there? When you saw her blow up after the ovulation? I saw her blow up mid February. I threw the nest box in there when I'm like, okay, fuck it. Like my other female that was bred at the same time is now in the nest box about to lay eggs. Like, let me try this with her. Maybe because I was told maybe you missed it. You probably missed it. You missed the ovulation. It was probably small. It's probably going to be slugs. It, you know, or maybe it's nothing. And I thought it was one of those times where it was nothing. But to be honest with you, I've never bred a snake and have it result with nothing. Like, it's every time I've bred, it's always resulted with eggs, except that one time with death. And even then, she still had eggs in her. So it was just odd. Like, so sick it, dude and these things could be so odd like i have i have a weird situation with my sarongs right now i have sarongs that have been locked up since mm -hmm. september of last year she's never gone off food until recently like she just went off food like three weeks two weeks ago um and mm -hmm. has not had a lock for like two months so and you know i don't know what's going on um i, I yeah i'm i don't know, I don't know. i'm leaving the i'm leaving the mail in there because it's not hurting anything I'm keeping an eye. Um, I'm just seeing what happens. But man, these things are just, 
you know, with the whole retaining sperm thing, it could just really throw it could just really throw things off. Like you just got to be ready at all times, basically. You know what I mean? Well, if you've had him in for like over a year or about a year, there is a very good possibility her going off feed means she developed follicles while they were breeding. I would yeah. be watching out to see if she ovulates or anything. I mean, yeah, I be before that though. Yeah, I mean, you'll you'll see like swelling on the sides too, maybe pushing out like they. You could almost see the ribs even on a fat chondro. Yeah. you'll be able to see the ribs a little bit like because they push. Right, you might be getting lucky pretty soon. I don't, bro. Are you kidding me? Like I have, like that don't mean shit. An ovulation don't mean shit. Eggs don't mean shit. I've already done this a couple times to realize that the road is so long ahead to get excited for anything. To where, like, I okay, I'll tell you how far I've gone. I've gone as far as a snake being alive, but not like I have yet to have one snake eat for me and live on. My very first chondro took for me twice. And then it died. It died during during a heat malfunction when I was in the hospital. So that fucking sucked. But this time around, Chapo 2.0, nothing, bro. Like this guy wants nothing to do with nothing, you know? Like, so I'm just like, and, and I'm, I'm just like, the smallest things excite me, but I'm not saying, oh, I'm locked in. You know, these aren't ball python clutches, is what I'm saying. Like, it's it's like the excitement, I, I try to keep to a minimal as possible. With any kind of sign of, um, you know, you know, stuff of being, you know, bre bred with the chondros, because anything could go wrong at any minute. Like, was it a sole survivor? Which one? El Chapo 2.0. Is he was yeah he was the only one to, to make it. He was the one only one out of fourteen to make it. Um, and because I fucked, I you know I had problems with my incubation. Like I was freaking out about the temps. And you know, socks slapped my hand on this a couple times, but I, you know, like, you know, it was just, it was. I kind of put my, I kind of kill, I kind of ruined it for myself just a little bit. But because of that, I only had one make it, um, and that was Chapo 2.0. So that's another reason why, you know, like it's, it's crazy how like no matter how well incubation could go for some clutches, mm -hmm. some neos just won't be established. Like they just won't yeah. get established. Um, how many of those have you actually had? Have you had any meals that you just couldn't get established? One. One. Okay. One. How, <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about that. And, and I can hear you talk. Keep talking. Yeah, that's the one I actually gave to my girlfriend that I was telling you guys about earlier. It's it's a female too. <laughs> it has a very beautiful blue like wash to it and everything. But it just it just refuses to actually get established the way the siblings do. And it's it's really hard to say. But there have been meals that like with me, for example, they, they will not eat. They just won't. Like, and those were the ones. Again, I had one other one like that. I gave it to my girlfriend, and the day she got it, it she said it's probably one of the best eaters she's ever had. It just nonstop like this. And sometimes the move can really make a difference. Like, it, wow. it, there's yeah, a little trick like that actually. Some people take their chondros on car rides and then come back and put them in like a different type of enclosure, a little more bare or a little more enclosed. And it really does make a difference because a lot of times, like maybe they just don't like their spot. Like it happens a lot. Like I've noticed that like they don't like their spot in the rack. It could be that very easily. They don't like the heating in the rack, the humidity in the rack. They could, they are more observant. Maybe they don't like the fact that the light is like right there where they're most comfortable. So it's sometimes you just have to experiment with it. Like if you're noticing that things are like, it's just constantly like this thing is giving me problems. Maybe it's it's not anything you're doing wrong. Maybe it's something to do with like where like even the positioning. Like it's happened many times where I move like the tub from the bottom of the rack to the top, like switch it out with a different problem eater, and both of them like start eating immediately. So yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. And then, I, and I do know there's a happy medium with the change. Like you know, I, what you're saying, like from from medium high, that's good. But I just don't feel like I feel like people change their environment too much. Like you know what I mean? And and I feel mm -hmm. like maybe that was my problem with Chapo 2.0. I kept putting him in too too many different places too much. You know, but like I mean, it could have been a lot of things. You just don't know, right? And yeah. that's the thing too. You really can't like kick yourself in the ass too much when there's a snake not eating. It's just you know, it's either gonna eat. Yeah. Or it's not going to eat. You know what I mean? Like it either has it in them or it doesn't have it in them. And mm. like a lot of people say, you know, 
a lot of them, a lot of people don't want to hold back a snake that's not a good eater, you know, because they don't want to pass that shit down to all their other hard work that they're putting into. Because you know, a lot of that shit's hereditary; like it trickles down to the to the to the offsprings. To where, like, now you have a bunch of neos that are like that one snake that's giving you all that problem. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't know if it is in fact hereditary, but why take the chance, right? Like, yeah, yeah, there's not. It's not really- Right. Like I would sooner give it away as a pet than probably breed it, you know, especially if you have a lot of different options there. I think that you want to make your life easier by breeding animals that just will health wise too will perform for you, you know, that won't respond to stress negatively, that are better eaters, that just better drinkers, you know, easier to defecate. You know, they don't prolapse like as, yeah, much or whatever. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, clearly. I'm not going to name drop the breeder, uh, but if you go back and listen to some podcasts, he actually said it. But, I mean, I know a breeder who actually only goes so long with their Neos, and if they don't make it, they don't make it. Like Meaning, like, they don't force feed. They don't do any of that shit. It's either going to make it or it's not going to make it. And when I, you know, and they usually say that takes about two months. Like, you'll know within the first month or two if this chondro is going to make it or not. And, you know, and that's like, you know, I appreciate everyone who goes – the, the the far and beyond because I feel like no matter what I'm gonna go far and beyond and try to get a, a chondro established but at the end of the day they don't have anybody in the wild to force feed them they don't have anything like only the strong survive in the wild you gotta understand yeah. even even a chondro that lays 20 eggs in the wild I guarantee not all 20 of those chondros are fucking making it exactly. I promise yeah. they're not they're not maybe none of them you know but like at the end of the day only the strong will survive and when you are working with so many different species and shit, you only want the best of the best. And yeah, you know, I don't know. You're, you're on the money with that one. Dude. Like, honestly, it's true. Like the reason why they have so many eggs is because not all of them are going to survive, you know? And yes, we do artificially keep them alive, but don't forget. We also artificially like are, are keeping them, you know, like they, they're not living in boxes out there. And in general, I mean, that it is an old school method. Let me put it like that. Like, you know, and uh, there are a lot of people that will go by that method. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to like kind of dismiss it because a lot of times it will make a difference when you just say, fuck it, either you're going to eat or you're, you're not. And sometimes you'll notice they will eat like the second you stop assisting them. But me personally, like I, I do like to give every single one of them a chance. So if there comes a point where I just simply can't even get ahead in them, then yeah, I'll I'll open their mouth and I'll just slide it in. Now I mean, what, it, what, it does. You know, it does for sure, because I've seen it. But also, what's your threshold for that? At what day mm-hmm. after after a shed are you like, all right, I need to shove a fucking pinky head down this thing's throat? Oh, that's tricky. Cause if they shed pretty fast, let's let's say a they normal shed, shed quick shed, yeah. yeah. Quick shed after seven days. I want to say after three weeks, I start worrying about it. After one month, I'm very worried about it. After like one month and like a few days, then I'm like, okay, this thing needs to, it needs to eat something. But too soon is also very problematic, dude. Like, right. I, I can't tell you like, I, I, I like exactly like why or how. I, I think it has to do with you just really turn them off for the future if you do it too soon. Like, I know there's a consensus where, like, and I, I am part of that consensus. You need to get them eating as soon as possible. It does help. But if, if you're doing it, like, by forcing too soon, it just, a lot of times, it, it can and will turn them off. And I've, I've experienced that myself. Like, with my first clutch, there were a couple that I told you how to prolong shed. And from those, I panicked. And I did at, at three weeks, I believe, three weeks and three and a half weeks. I assisted a, a few of them. And those, it took a little longer than the ones that I didn't assist. Wow. So you, you learn like that, you know, like, and everybody has their own truths. Let me put it like, you know, everybody has their own wisdom to offer. And a lot of times, like, it, it could be completely different than the person next to you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you can't really ever just dismiss one thing, you know, and you can't really ever just go by one thing. You have to kind of think about it for yourself and do it and live it and see it like feel it on your own skin, like what works and what doesn't. And at the end of the day, from in my own case, the reason why I'm not really too 
you know, like overthinking my my situation with the Condros because I've only had two clutches. Like experience is the best teacher. The more you take hacks, the more you fucking get up to the plate and swing that bat, the more you learn on each clutch. Yeah. And I have no regrets, man. Like I said, you know, yeah, I, I did I want more results? Of course I would like better results, but at the end of the day, I did something. You know what I mean? Like I feel like any progress is good progress with these Condros. I really do feel like. Yeah, I mean Honestly, even if you get one to hatch, you still got one to hatch, you know, and yeah. it's it's a new life. It's, it's a new life. It's yeah, awesome. in, yeah. in general, I'm I'm a pretty I'm pretty big on like making sure they all have the, the most the best chance at survival. Right. You know, so I yeah, it is a learning process and if you're seeing something doesn't work, like switching it up, you know, like it's never getting married to one thing, like one right. idea. If it, if it doesn't work is what I mean. If it's working, then by all means, like put a ring on that bitch. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Lock it up. Um, yeah. Right on. Now, I can't help to notice how, how healthy, and when I say healthy, I feel like you're feeding your animals the way you should be. But what are you, what do you feed your females and what do you feed your adult males? And we could just stick to adults for now. But what, are, what's oh. your, what do you feed them and how often are you feeding them? Every two weeks. I feed them every two weeks and I feed them a, a jumbo mouse. And that's for all of them except for females when it's breeding season. When it's breeding season, I'll, I'll alternate with uh, a smallish mouse, like 60 grams, I want to say. Hmm. Approximately around there, 60, 65. And if you look at it actually very candidly, by percents, I mean, this is where the, the geekness comes out. That's actually quite light considering the size of these animals. Right. Because, yeah, they're quite big. So if you look at, let's say, a, a 50 gram a jumbo mouse, which might be very big in comparison to a smaller female, compared to a 1,400 or 1,200 gram female, that's only like three, four percent of its body weight. Right. You know, so it, it's it's keeping them lean, even though they're eating every two weeks. It's it's still relatively small in relation to the size of the snake. As opposed to if you were to feed that same jumbo mouse to the same aged female, but half of the size, you know, like then that that 50 gram, let's say mouse compared to a 500 gram female might be 10 percent of its weight. You know, it's a huge difference. So if you look at it like that, it, it is somewhat light. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And half the year, my males don't even eat because they're off feed breeding. OK, so, even when they're not breeding, actually, that's how you know kind of like they're it, this dude's horny like <laughs> he wants to get it uh, yeah i mean, I, but I, i've had males that were locking all horny and still eating too like i've yeah, i've had males that just keep plowing you know what i mean which is crazy i think i think it depends on the personality of the, the it male. Does. it does it really does like i definitely, definitely. now now would you go back to the 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 you feeding your animals jumbo mouse, jumbo mice, and then you say the breeder females get like a small rat, right? Uh, you, I toss it up, I switch it up. Depending, oh, it, 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 though. is like, this in, is this the heart in the heart of breeding? Is when you're doing that, like when she looks yeah. big and stuff like that? Yeah, if you, I don't like doing it too early because you don't want to go into the breeding season with fat females. Let me put it like that: you really don't want to, and you don't want to go in there with an like a, a skinny female either, like. I feel like maybe I don't know which one might have a better chance, but either way, there's it's still it's all part of that golden medium. You're you're not there where you need to be. If she's too skinny, she doesn't have what's necessary, and if she's too fat, she definitely like is is not gonna do well for you. You know, like you need her to be muscular and lean, like you know, and that's why I like mice in general. That I feel like they have higher levels of protein in them higher levels of calcium, even though jumbos, not as much as large mice because they're retired breeders and everything. But at the end of the day, you still need to get some food into your snake because a jumbo mice mouse is still relatively small in comparison to like a female that's this big, you know, like, I mean, if it's one thing I wish I could still have, and I'm pretty sure you already know this cause you're in California, but man, I used to love feeding my chondros ASFs, bro. Like yeah. ASFs were like fucking, not only did they go ballistic over it, but I just felt like that was the perfect size rodent for a, a fucking chondro. Like it was just a, it was a mouse on steroids. You know what I mean? Like, but you know, I, I mean, I don't know. Like at the end of the day, I know breeders who just feed 
strictly rats, like even some medium rats, you know what I mean? And are still good at, at, at their production. Um, it all depends on how, you know, how you have your, your snakes diet program set up. But let me ask you this. Do you feel like somebody who feeds them their snake majority rats is going to affect their breeding? Is that, is that, do you feel like the too much fat is going to affect them from giving you too much clutch or like, what do you feel like? Where's like, where do you feel like that, that, that I'll lands at? I'll tell you if, if you're trying to, if, okay, th th this is a little uh, trickier to explain, but I'll do my best. It's just, again, it, it's my thoughts on the subject. Like oh. I, I don't want anyone in the crowd to think this is like fact or anything. These are just my observations. What I've seen, there is nothing in my opinion that's actually wrong with feeding rats. However, usually, especially for chondros, because we, they're not the largest snake species, you know, they're relatively small. Right. The size of feeder that they're going to be able to handle, like for the most part in general, they'll be able to get more nutrition from the same size mouse as they will a rat. As in that same, like, let's say, we're, let's talk about a large mouse, for example versus uh, a weanling rat. A weanling rat is pretty much primarily fat, you know, whereas a large mouse is has a lot of nutrition to it. So I would, of course, always rather pick the, ma the mouse than the rat, especially considering like they're much cheaper too. It's There's no like second thoughts about that. Immediately I would go for the mouse. However, when you get to a certain size, let's say, let's say if your snake is huge, like huge, huge, one, you're going to want to feed it like something that it will be able to handle a little easier. Or, But also you want it to get proper nutrition. I, I feel like a larger rat, like if, if, if the snake was somehow big enough to handle it, let's say snake, these chondros could grow big. Yes, they would much rather, they would be much better off with a, a rat that had that kind of nutrition and that size instead of feeding like three or four different mice. You know what I mean? Like, but our chondros don't ever get that big that we need to worry about that. Like it's not, we're, we're never going to feed them a jumbo rat. They'll never get that big. So, I mean, a lot of times the reason why I guess rats can be beneficial is one, it's a different prey. So you get a chance to switch it up a little bit at least if there is in fact like some sort of nutrition in the rat that the mouse doesn't have. And it helps a lot of times with eggs, like with breeding and what you just, Sometimes you get better results. Sometimes you might get more eggs. Like even, I mean, it's been documented too. Like, but the thing is, you don't want to pump them on rats. That's a mistake I see a lot of people make. Is they they assume that oh, let's say they have a female that's right on the verge of becoming an adult from sub adult. That they'll want to like oh let let me get her on rats and get her big. You're not actually getting her big on the size of rat you're gonna give her. You're getting her fat. There's a huge difference. Like. That's like saying, I, I want to grow to be six feet. Let me go eat <laughs> McDonald's or something like the McFlurry every day. Like you're not going to become six feet from eating a McFlurry every day. Listen, like, listen, listen, my females, my females are right here and they hear everything you're saying and they eat rats. So I would just relax right now. Okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, there's nothing wrong with rats, but if like, by there's nothing wrong with big women either. Okay. You just need to just fucking, you know what I mean? Like they all need love, bro. I, there's more of them to love, right? <laughs> but listen, okay, in all seriousness, it, it makes so much sense because one of the biggest things I learned with the ball pythons was like it all matters how you fucking get these females fed for their breeding season come the next year. And you don't yeah. want to get them on fucking big ass meals right out of a clutch. Like you want to get them up to size to where they were prior to their 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 first the clutch that they just laid, right? But like in my head, I always I was always told. And this is just the, the way people fucking told me in the beginning that you just want ball pythons could eat and you just want to feed them as much as you possibly can. But really that what you're saying about the chondros clearly makes sense and relates to ball pythons as well, because you don't want a fat ass snake going exactly. into the breeding season because more than likely they're not even going to breed for you because they're putting in too much work, working all that fucking fat, like all that, all the energy is getting put into the fat. Versus putting into them developing follicles and getting eggs. Um, and I feel like that's why I had last year, I had a, a few females that they, I knew they looked pretty big and they laid the year before, but they didn't lay last year. Um, and Brian Barcheck gave me this whole conversation about this, which last year I went ahead and took his advice and I kept it less is more. 
way less is more and they fucking those girls are all on eggs right now you know what i mean so it's like it all makes sense bro it all relates to the same shit i feel like yeah it's it's keeping it simple honestly like i said it's keeping it simple golden medium don't overfeed don't underfeed and keep it simple like you know it's easier for you too right mj to remember like oh every two weeks every two weeks rather than like let me play it by ear you know like it's just easier that way. Yes, in the breeding season, you're going to need to sometimes play it by ear, you know, but it's good to go on with a plan, you know? The plan is the best thing. And the cool thing is, it's like, I mean, I one thing I appreciate the chondros is like right when you feel like, okay, I got this to change, there's something else you should change. Like it's always like there's always something you can learn. And and I love it though, man, because at the end of the day, you could you could pick your own route. So many people have different styles of how they raise their chondros, how they breed them, and some you know it works for them, right? But at the end of the day, you decide on what you want to put a part of your regiment and what's a part of your game plan. Um, yeah. And like another thing, right? Like here's another thing I always like I refuse to do, but it's not a bad thing to do. People do it, but people soaking their rodents in water. Um, do you soak their, your rodents in water and give them soggy uh, rodents? Do, do you do that? Is that, is that your thing? But I know exactly what you're talking about because I have. there are many, many times where I have not soaked them in water, but like a lot of water has gone into the bag while I've been defrosting them. And it's just – That's by mistake. That's not on purpose. Yeah, they just don't want to eat it anymore for some reason. Like, oh, who, has, who wants a soggy-ass dinner? Bro, okay, <laughs> no offense, bro, but like I just like – and this is just – everyone has their own style. But I – ever since the beginning, I remember following people and seeing them putting fucking 20, 30 rodents in one big bucket full of water. And they're just like – you just see splashing. Wow. Huh? It helps though. That's the it thing. Does, it really it does. Does. There's a purpose to it. No, yeah. there's a there's a purpose to it, but me, I don't need to do that. And I, I, I just, that's disgusting. I feel like, and I, I feel like I wouldn't want to do that to my snake. They don't, they don't pick rodents out out of the river every day. Maybe every now and then they'll, they'll run into the fucking water, I guess. But mm. I don't know, man. It's all, I feel like at the end of the day, like I know a lot of people do it is for the hydration. They want to make sure that yeah. their snakes are getting the fluids that they need after a meal, which makes a lot of sense. I actually also heard that people soak their rodents to soften the nails because the, to keep the nails. I don't know if that's true or not. I heard that on Facebook, of course. Of course it was on Facebook, but. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, shit. Sorry, uh, sorry man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we get before we get off, before we get off the topic of rodents, where do you pick up your rodents from? Who do you get your rodents from? Do you get like local or what? Yeah, there, there's a local supplier here. It's Lane Labs. I, I it was just the first person that I tried, and it was they they were really good, like in the sense of their packaging and things like that. So I never really like kind of tried looking elsewhere. But recently, I have been looking for ASFs, you know, and I have friends right now that are working on them, like on on creating a. a like a, a rodent colony, like a ASF. But in general, I'm not opposed to trying new things. You know, you never know. Cause there are people out there that are really, they really take it very seriously. Like what they feed their rodents. And that does make a huge difference. Like yeah, that goes into your snake at the end of the day. You know, if they're like, would you rather have the rodent eating McDonald's or, again? Or would you rather have it eating like some sort of like chicken breast or something, you know? I, Maybe that's not the best example, of course, but you get what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah, I hear you. I feel like that all matters, and that's why I fuck with Cold Blooded Cafe. Just mm -hmm. saying, Cold Blooded Cafe has that premium, premium. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, man, I, I feel like the ASF things. Now, I, I'm curious. ASFs, we could get those dead already, right? Like, is that is that okay to get dead ASFs? Yeah, of course. Frozen I mean, as long as they were, as long as they're alive. Were, not alive right? Yeah. Right? frozen correctly because you don't want them to defrost over there at any point and then they freeze it again it that's, and that's just the general rule with like anything like you know the second it defrosts it starts picking up bacteria harmful bacteria so you, you never want to put it back in the freezer if you're not going to use it you throw that away you know right yeah, yeah. that's true now yeah. um i have a question for you now with your you know with your you offering uh you know, obviously you, you do the day one pinks, mouse pinks for the, the neonates, your babies, right, that you hatch. Mm -hmm. Now, 
sometimes you have to just offer a head. How do you determine a head versus a full body? Like when, when do you, when do you decide to offer which, which? So honestly, I try to keep it a whole pink as much as possible. And I don't like that even applies to like the super tiny twin that I hatched out this year. I tried feeding it a whole pink because in general, there are parts of that pink that you want like to give to, you know, like there's a liver, there's a kidney, it's all sorts of things. And you're only giving it a head and people will say it's the most nutritious part, but there are still other nutritious parts. I feed the head like, again, I always try like, cutting it in half first before trying just the head because i try to get as much of the pink in there as possible but sometimes the weight of the pinky itself is already like too much too much for let's say a, a 12 gram snake or something you know like it's yeah. it's too much like it just doesn't want to hold it like on its neck it feels that pressure it drops it and a lot of times like the, the smaller you cut it and especially the way you feed it too you want to feed it with the snout facing the snake so it gets jammed in there Right. You know, and when it gets jammed in there, the way their teeth are shaped, it's like curved, you know, it's like hooks. So it's hard for them to spit it back up. They end up swallowing and they learn how to eat like that because not all of them know how to eat. So if it's something like that, yeah, I want to say like you just keep going, like cutting it once in half and then cutting to see if it's the weight that's actually the problem. And then if it's not, then you cut it by the head and you get it to choke on it. And yeah, <laughs> and it learns how to eat. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, because I, I I was always curious about that, but that makes so much sense. If you have a chondro that's taking wrapping but just dropping it, yeah. more likely it's the weight. So that's why you determine how much to cut, and that makes a lot of sense, man. Yeah, and a lot of people are, I guess, they, they start off a little bit scared, too, to feed a baby snake a pink because in comparison, it looks big. Like chondros in general, when they're born, are 8 to, like, 12 grams. Yes, there are some that are born, like, Again, I've had some that are born close to 15, and right. I've had a twin that's born four grams, four. But wow. in general, if you want to take like just across the board, eight to 12. That's crazy. Pink is like what, one to two grams. That's over 10% of its body weight, like chances are. It could be 15 even. Like it's huge in comparison to the snake, but when they're smaller, they're able to handle these things much, much better. And, and you know, like, if your water is clean, I don't suspect that you you'll have a prolapse either. You know, I mean, I've I've never seen one in a baby like that. You know, and I've pretty much primarily started them on whole pinks, and then even the second meal been large pinks, and th those were the larger snakes, of course, like the ones born closer to fifteen grams. But right. even still, like it's a, it's a very wide range, like they can handle. We didn't get to talk about this. I know it was, you know, you, you said it was straightforward with your incubation and whatnot, but what temps are you cooking at and, and what day are you normally seeing pips? Uh, 87 until day 40 and then uh, 85 after that, just straight. Like those two, I mean, technically that's not a straight bake because again, it's 87 and then 85. I do get eggs later, like uh, later than most people. I get them on day 51 to 54. And yes, it takes a little longer, but in general, almost all of the snakes I've hatched with this method, they, they've come out with fully absorbed yolk. Like they didn't come out with yolk hanging or anything like that. It just seems to work. So you like, drop it, you drop it two degrees or two and a half degrees. I'm sorry, you said 87 to 85, you said, right? Yeah. So you drop it two degrees the last 10 days, or I'm sorry, what what after 40 days. After so after so meaning day 41 is when you drop that to 10 grams. Day 40, day 41. It usually doesn't make too big of a difference right there and then. Like I've done 41 and I've done 40. And in fact, a lot of it ha has to do with uh, the eggs and how many there are in the incubator, the size of your incubator, different things like that. They all play some sort of variable in there. Right. Like when I had a, this last clutch, I had a lot of eggs. Like it was like what, 23, 24, something like that. Because there were so many eggs in there, it just there was a lot more heat as well. Like they hatched on day 50. Like, and it was like I was shocked because I just came home randomly and see there's like a head, and then I go like get a drink of water, come back, and I see two more. Like, like I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is great. Yeah, fuck it. You talk yeah. about great. Jesus, man. Now, do you normally keep all the neos together for their first shed, or do you separate them right away? Like that's old school. I, I feel like I, I get nothing wrong with that, but it is old school. Uh, I like to personally wait for all of them to hatch, then give it a day maybe or something like that, just so they have those temps there. And then I just put them in individual tubs, give it a few more days or something. And 
try uh, feeding trials. So you, so immediately after a day of them being out of the egg, they go to their own little, their own little. No, no, no. no. I wait, I wait for them all to come out before all of them. and after the day. And you get a big ass picture like that too. So got you sick. Yeah. Oh, which reminds me, dude. Oh my god, we have to look at this picture, please. Hold on one second. But yeah, it's okay because the first clutch you had of the year, which we're gonna pull up now, were how many how many neos did you have in that clutch? I'm gonna pull it up right now. Seventeen and one was born with only one eye. Okay, one was born. And how's that? Is that one still alive right now? It's going through OCC, developing black scales all over. With one eye. It was a gift to my girlfriend once again, and she's killing it with it. Like she's doing amazing. That thing is the same size as everything else. Got started the same time as everything else, and that was actually an egg that rolled. Uh, this ain't we, it. This uh, ain't it, though. This ain't it. The clutch we're talking about, is it? No, no. It's it keeps scrolling down. Right here. Uh, nope, that's the second one. Oh, here we go. Right here. There we go. That's it. It starts from the right, goes to the left. Yeah. That's oh it. my god. Yeah. You bastard. <laughs> You're just killing it, bro. Now, Look at this. Email I was telling you about too, by the way. The the one that had the regurge that was horribly undersized with stuck shed and everything. Yeah, she gave me tw twenty two or twenty three eggs. They should say there, and yeah. I, uh, four of them were infertile or something like that. And then there was one that was a boob egg, and it was a fertile boob egg. But I feel like I've never really seen boob eggs truly hatch like that and be well off. So it, that it was under the the rest of them perfect, except for the one with one eye. But even then, that one's perfect too. The only reason it was born with one eye because I had even marked the egg too was because it rolled in the fucking incubator. Oh um, my, that's the worst. It rolled like three, like one fourth of the way, and that was enough. Like for a few hours, when I wasn't home, my sister came, probably slapped my incubator, trying to see you know if I was home or whatever. And I come home and I see there's an egg on its side, which you know because you'll see on my eggs, I mark an X there to know where the embryo is faced up. Right. It was rolled to the side. And then one was born without an eye. So. Wow, bro. And his name is Bullseye. <laughs> Perfect. I didn't even come up with that. She did it all on her own. Hey, I have a question for you. If you if you happen to know this yet with your experience, but I'm noticing, and I've noticed this before, look at the different – in the coloration in this fucking neo right here uh, the orange one do you see it in the middle number three yeah that thing was born with burnt orange diamonds and a now, have, is that, have you raised have you raised one like that before and see what the difference is like like do you know do you normally know what that's gonna look like or no i haven't raised one that looks like that but i have one chronos had burnt orange diamonds as a baby Oh my God. So that's a hitter. You're keeping that one for sure, yeah. right? You're going through OCC. It's half black right now. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> Damn. I mean, and they're half siblings, actually. Now that uh, we're talking about it, they have the same father. Oh my God. Look at this. These yeah. guys, half siblings. <sighs> I'm getting anxiety right now. It, it was pretty cool, man. Like all Look these at little that mouth. Elements. Look at yeah. this mouth, bro. Look at that. Looks like a watermark. Looks like a, looks like a, like a, a defect, but it's not. <laughs> Red, look, at look at that. Oh, my God. They're super friendly, dude. These guys, they, they never try striking. They're, they're just the chillest things ever. The other two clutches are just complete orange. assholes, but these guys are so friendly. So yeah. orange. So amazing, bro. Oh yeah. my God. All right. Um, I have a question for you now. I know you've only really been in the game for a handful of years or not even three years or so 2018. Um, but what has been your experience with Nido? Have you had any Nido pro Nido problems or like in the beginning, like anything like that? Or can you tell us your, yeah. your, your, your uh, knowledge on Nido? So I, I do test like, again, my, my Neos and things like that, that I produce everything like that. I haven't had one come back positive, but I do have a couple actual bold statements I want to make about this because I feel like there's a lot of extra panic and everything, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. My experience with that, again, it's pretty much that is the, the people who have asked for an, uh, a needle test. I've done it right there. And then like, again, considering that I'm selling these guys, if they ask for it, they pay for it. They get it, you know? I mean, I know my stuff is clean because like I've separated, I've, you know, like no matter what, 
if there's an adult and there's a baby, it gets separated. I don't care if it's NIDO. I don't care if it's IBD. I don't care what it is. It gets separated because there is still like all these viruses, bacteria, pathogens that we don't know like that they can have. And it might not cause any problems now or next generation or two generations later, but later down the line, you never know. Cause it's not like NIDO just appeared out of nowhere the past five years. It was in people's collections. So in general, I try keeping everything very separate, separate instruments, separate everything. And I, I, I just, I feel like that's right. You know, like, I feel like that's the right way to do it. My, my adult collection, like I said, I've been lagging it. Yes. Like getting the tests and whatnot. The thing is with that is the reason why is I'm not selling any of those. They're completely separated. They're doing their own thing. When I have the chance, when, you know, like I feel like I'm ready to hold down a much larger snake, <laughs> you know, that can easily <laughs> cause nerve damage. Yeah, I'll, I'll test it. But in general, I keep it separate, you know, like very, very separate. And I haven't had any problems. I've tested many, many times. Even P everyone, a lot of the people who have gone for me have tested their snakes again a few times. No problems like that. But there is a lot of panic when it comes to Nido. And uh, again, reasonably so. Let me put it like that because a lot of people have lost very expensive collections. So I tell everyone, do your due diligence, especially if you're buying something new. Do your due diligence. Ask, you know, like ask if it's been tested. You can even ask to get it tested again. Uh, again, even more importantly, see the way they handled like their quarantine. Like see, see how they handle their snakes. Like how like laxy daisy are they or how like uptight are they with it? And another thing, please do not euthanize an animal just because it has Nido. This is where I'm very bold about this. And I, I really want to take a stance like is I have a lot of respect for guys out there and girls that are keeping Nido positive collections because they're doing a lot of really good work with animals that people think are untouchable with animals that people are scared to get in the room with. With, like that disease isn't, it's not like it's going to affect the human, you know, like, yes, you don't want to track it back to your original correct collection. I completely understand that. And I completely like applaud people for being extra, extra cautious with it, but do not kill your animal. Cause there are people out there that right now would probably kill for that animal with Nido that don't have these breeding intentions, selling intentions that just want a pet. You know, you know what I mean? Like it would be one of those things. Like imagine like, me personally sell a very healthy, good snake without Nido. And let's say because of the negligence of somebody else, like they, they infect their own Neo they got from me with Nido and then they want to euthanize it. That would be like grounds for, I don't want to talk to you anymore. You, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's one of those things that you can breed it out of collections, you know, like, and you know what? You don't want to do it yourself. That's fine. It, Give it to somebody that's going to keep it as a pet or somebody who has a positive collection. Like, honestly, like props to those guys who are keeping a lot of these, like almost like a lot of these bloodlines alive because they're able to work with these needle positive collections, you know, props to them, you know, that's just my stance on it. Like, and there are strains that are very deadly, very dead. Cause there are many strains with it. And there are some that are very deadly and some that you won't even notice a, like a difference, not even, not, not a, a damn thing, but yeah. either way, you never know how another snake is going to react to that same string. I've heard multiple stories of yeah. like a snake completely rolling over, dying from Nido, and then basically the male or whoever that was paired to it survived and perfectly fine. There's no issues with it. Yeah, it all depends, man. Like, I like you know, like we were talking about the stress thing. You know, I feel like that stress factor plays a huge part. Some snakes overstress it, you know, and, they, and they're, they they can't handle being sick, you know? Yeah, if, if you find out, let's say you have one in your collection that, that has it, don't panic. Like, it's the same snake it was like a day ago. Like, you're, like you're not going to – why would you just kill it? You know what I mean? Like, if I found out, let's say, Kronos or Blue Moon had it, Right. Who, who in their right mind would think I, I would euthanize that snake? No, of course not. You don't need to sell it. You don't need to, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, you don't need to sell anything from your adult collection. You don't even need to keep it if you're that scared. You give it to somebody who's going to keep it as a pet. Give it to somebody who has extra space to be able to work with a positive collection. But, you know, it's don't, pa don't panic and immediately rush to let me just put this thing down. You know, it's just, 
it's unnecessary. The snake didn't like do anything. I know I sound like one of those guys that's like maybe overly sensitive with this stuff, but it's just my personal opinion on this. Like, I don't think yeah, anyone should be, yeah, killing a, a perfectly healthy asymptomatic snake, you know? Yeah, I feel like there's no point of ending the damn snake's life. If you simply don't want it a part of your collection, well, then find somebody who's willing to work with it and, exactly. and keep Maybe it alive. Find a contract too, like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to breed this. If you're, if you're really that scared that it's going to pass on to the offspring and then spread into different people's collections, yeah, make them sign something like that if that's what you're concerned. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't know, sorry. I know I was pretty bold about that, but it's just one of those things I've been seeing. And, you know, it's kind of like – no, well, you just no. You gotta say something, you know. No, hundred percent. Now let me ask you this: I'm gonna bridge this to like my wrap up question here for you, because, you know, like I talk about how many new people are coming into this industry. You know, shit. Some people are going straight to chondros. You know, it's not all fucking rosy boas and then ball python and chondros. It's some people just go straight to chondros. But what do you think some of these new keepers should consider, or what do you feel like is in vital to them? Um, as far as in their beginning stages of wanting to collect chondros and breed? Well, with the breeding thing, I would say make sure you've done a good amount of research and make sure you do have time on your hands to be able to do this because it is time consuming. But with that said, it is also very rewarding and I think you should give it a shot because right. again, the, the things that sometimes come the hardest are also the things that bring you the greatest amount of joy. And I guess... A lot of times you'll see like on social media, people will be discouraging to you for at, like asking a simple question. And yes, I, I do see why it could happen. Like you might just come across like that you're just rushing into it without doing your homework. So they want to set you straight. But in general, if you really genuinely love it and want to succeed with it, like do it. There's nothing that's stopping you. I mean, it, it's only going to take one person to take a chance on you the same way one person took a chance on me. You know, and, and the same way a lot of the people I've sold to actually have been new keepers. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, if, if you see someone is doing their homework, you see they're passionate, I don't see why not. I would say do what you are actually passionate about. Don't look to your left and right and add, like see what, what's selling the highest, what other people don't like or what they do like the goals that they have, what are your goals? What are your passions? What do you actually want to see? That's what right. you need to be focused on. Like the, the things you, you personally love, because everyone at the end of the day, they're going to ask you questions. Like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you go with this route? Like, why don't you buy this? Like, if, if you don't love it, don't do it. Like, Simple. you know what I mean? Like, I, that's what I want to say. Like, do what you love. You, you put time, you put care, you put effort you'll see the reward in it. You'll definitely see the reward in it. Even if like you have hiccups along the road, when you love something, you, you find a way to succeed at it. Yeah, for reals. And you don't let much stop you. I'll tell you that much. Like, you know, as much as, uh, you know, cause like we, to go back to how Andrew, my boy, my, one of my, you know, my homie told me how like, you know, chondros aren't for the faint at heart. Like it's not made for that. And I'm not gonna lie. I'm a sensitive dude, bro. Like I'm sensitive as fuck. And, um, uh, I had not dealt with any dead snakes. I have not, you know, I was breeding ball pythons, but nothing, you know, nothing was dying on me until mm -hmm. I started keeping chondros. And that's when, you know, like I had to literally stomach it and like say, all right, if you need to accept that things will die and that you need to fucking let it go, like it's okay to be upset, but it can't ruin your day. And I came a long ways, bro, from like literally slamming doors to being so <laughs> mad to where, bro, like it's, I, you know, I have a saying, charge it to the game, bro. It is what it is. Like, what are you going to do? You know what you signed up for. And especially if you're keeping so many animals. And that's the thing, bro. Like, I, I do have a, a lot on my plate. But I purposely put this shit on my plate. And I'm dealing with what comes with it. And it's not always fun. It's not always fucking like, you know what I mean? Like, up, you know, it's a lot of it's downs, man. But I, I you know. I am in a I am in a great position working with animals that like you said earlier people mm -hmm. some people would fucking kill to have some of these animals especially from you like you're coming from you man like god like I'm coming from someone who dreams about just you know like owning something like yours someday but at the end of the day man all the stars align for a reason and I feel like you know you are definitely meant to be working with these snakes you're doing a hell of a job man you're you're, you're just killing it 
Thank you. I appreciate that, MJ. Honestly, I really do. So um, this has been an amazing two and a half hours, bro. Like I said, you know, we've had fucking we had at least up to 80 people up here at one point. But before I let you go, um, I got to hit you with the hot seat questions. OK, so I got some cool. I got some hot seat questions for you. Let me whip them out. Condra edition real quick. So they're, they're special, uh, special for uh, for the homie here. Um, right. Now, I don't need an explanation. Do your best to just give me the answer one or the other. OK, I appreciate it. That's how the hot seat questions work. But here I'll we go. Either. <laughs> Hot seat question for the homie Derek. Here we go. Frozen thought or live? Frozen thought and live when you're trying to get a male to start eating again. If, if you're having trouble with an older male that's off feed, feed it live. But okay. frozen thought always is much better in my opinion. All right. Here we go. Let me rewind this. You have a room that we eat all live or you have a room that we eat all frozen thought. It just doesn't matter what – would you do frozen thought or live frozen thought any day any day what you, you, you want to make as frozen thought any day because you want to make it as easy for you as possible that's how your snakes are going to thrive when, when you and your snakes both are on the same page yeah so frozen thought definitely okay cool uh definitely. eight cut or no cut what what what's a cut a cut or no oh, cut hell yeah hell yeah, hell yeah. But I always wait. I always wait until like at least an hour or two until I come home and see like, oh, there are a few heads that are popping out. Then I wait. I go eat something, drink something, get myself in the head space and go in there with shaky ass hands like this every single time, all five times. At what point would you let the clutch how, – how, how late would you let the clutch go before cutting it? Like let's say you don't have any pips. Oh, I, I'd let it go indefinitely. So even so – so you you let something pip no matter what before you cut. Well, I always let I, yeah, because th that's how you know that they're ready. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of people have results like, and usually it's poor results when they cut too early. Like, if they're not ready to come out, they're not ready to come out. But when a few are already out or one or two, you already know they're kept in the same incubator, most likely in the same hatch box, most likely under the same temps. The rest are probably going to be ready. Okay. Sports or no sports? What are sports? Okay, good, good respect. Uh, steak or fish? Oh, sport. <laughs> oh sport. Uh, sport. No sport. I thought, uh, no. I thought sports. You, yeah, like, do you, do you like sports oh, or no sport. sport? Oh, I love sports, but I'm, I, I like playing them more than I like watching them. Yeah. Okay, so sports. Okay, so baseball or UFC, football? UFC. UFC all day, every day. More than all of that. UFC. I love that. Okay. Favorite UFC fighter? Favorite? <laughs> Shit, I want to say Khabib. I, I like Khabib. Khabib? John oh, Jones. All right, all right. Uh, steak or fish? Steak. I, I don't eat any fish. Wow. Okay, respect. Um, Eminem or Machine Gun Kelly? <laughs> uh, Eminem probably, but Machine Gun Kelly, he was pretty good in their rap battle. Okay. I guess I'm just kidding. Uh, was, props, dude. It, it was it was pretty catchy. He did go off. I will say he did go off. That was actually a good time right there. That was cool to watch him go back and forth, and it was cool just to see him kind of piss Eminem off and, and you know kind of oh, get, yeah. have him go. Off. Yeah, he's Eminem, like you know, he's slim shady. All right, right. <laughs> uh, West Coast rap or East Coast rap? Oh shit, West. Uh, hmm. Depends. I, I can't answer that one. Depends the song. You have to. Like, there's no, no depending. Like, we can't stop this unless you pick West Coast rap or East Coast East rap. Coast rapper. East Coast. Wow. Okay. Tight. Uh, Wu Tang or Gangstar? I don't know those. I don't know what those are. <laughs> How do you say East Coast, dude? We gotta talk after this, bro. I'm gonna move forward. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, little word association. First thing to come to mind: milk. What? Milk. Uh, cereal. Okay, cocoa. Nuts. Cocoa nuts. Sub substrate. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, 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 I fucking enrichment. Uh, livelihood. <laughs> Stuck shed. 
<laughs> Hydration. Okay. Day 56. Don't cut. <laughs> <laughs> Instagram trolls. Spam. Spam. Okay. Now, one has to go forever, and I mean forever. Like forever, ever. Red Neo or Yellow Neo? <laughs> <laughs> you really want people to hate me after this. <laughs> how, how about paradoxes? No. <laughs> It, it, dude, one has to go forever, the red or the yellow. It's not a God, – God is making you do this. And if you don't believe in God, then I'm, I, the, the podcast is making you do this. Red or yellow, what's it going to be? Forever. Here we go. You know the answer. <laughs> I didn't even hear it. No, I can't say that one. I can't. I love yellow nails too. I love. I like reds more, yes, but I love yellow nails too. Just so too, you're saying red. Hospitals come from yellow meals and even like you can get melanism out of yellow meals too. So I just can't say it like, but, like, but what you're saying is red. So you're, They're so what you're people. saying is red. What but, I'm saying. Is, so what you're saying I is red. To only keep one. It would be red. If I had to only keep one, it's Thank I'm you. already oh, only keeping red. Yeah. But I, w I would definitely not get rid of so, yellows. What Garrett is saying is you have no chance in this game. If you have a yellow Neo. No, <laughs> no, no, definitely not. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I got yellow neos. I'm just kidding. I got two of them. I'm just kidding, bro. They're, they're just, pretty beautiful. Um, I've seen them. I love the sarongs you got there too. Actually, well, I think it kind of paused for a second. Hello. Damn. It's always at the last minute. We have like one viewer here, but it's all good. We'll finish this up, man. My bad, bro. 
It's okay. Somebody said that's why you don't download porn before the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I don't have that problem. I got a hot ass wife. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know who that. I don't. I don't know who that person sleeps next to at night. But I don't. I don't have that problem. I don't fucking download porn, so probably not. Uh, but anyways, man, listen. This has been an amazing time. Wait, did we even finish? Or oh yeah, you you said red. So red neos. He decided are the best, mm. and that's that. Garrett, what do you have to say to all your supporters out there, bro? Everyone who's fucking been watching you and supporting you, I'm telling you right now, you have mad support. A lot of people excited for, for tonight's episode. And I got to admit, this shit was amazing. This was all heat. But what do you have to say to all your supporters out there, bro? Man, honestly, you guys have no idea how much it actually means to me, especially the way I see that a lot of you, it, all of you pretty much have been very supportive, very, very just – Karen, you really loved it the same way I have, you know, the, the chondros and everything like that, especially uh, the people that are working with uh, the GG animals and everything, man, you thank you guys. Cause I, I hear it from you a lot too. And thank you guys for coming on the show too. It means a lot. And it was just, it was fun. Honestly, it really was. Well, like I say, man, this is something that's beyond round two worthy. I will have you back on again, bro. But thank you so much thank for not you. only, I want to say, man, for not only giving me and the viewers the time of day, but honestly supporting what I've been doing and giving me that encouragement, hearing that somebody like you who's so vested in his projects that listen to this podcast really means a lot to me. So I appreciate that. And thank you so much for being a, a guest. And I can't wait to have you back on, bro. Definitely. Thank you again for having me, MJ. All right, man. Have a good night, Garrick. And, and we'll talk soon. We need to talk. You know what I mean? We got we to talk. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you soon, man. Uh, yeah, for sure. All right, take care. Later, All right. Peace out. Wow. GG. It's a wrap, baby. The House of Blue in the books. Man, sorry about that fucking internet connection our internet was out on the block like almost all day but we're, i don't know why do i need to explain myself it is what it is i i made it closed it out thank you so much for all the viewers thank you for everyone who uh tuned in and tapped in man if you were really paying attention then you would know how much heat was just dropped on tonight's episode with my man garrick from the house of blue and i cannot wait to go have a conversation with my man because i need to find out why he doesn't know who wu-tang is and why he doesn't know who the fuck gangstar was i mean how old is he, man? He can't be that young. Fuck. Anyways, he's still a homie. He still produces some of the nicest chondros in the United States. So we give him a huge pass on that one. But guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Just make sure you are ready for tomorrow morning's um, Animal Bites TV's plugs. I'm dropping a sick-ass episode, and I just want you guys to be prepared for that tomorrow. So make sure you guys go over Animal Bites TV channel, subscribe, and be ready to be tapped into some sick-ass shit. And thank you so much for tapping into this coolest reptile podcast in the world. You guys know the deal. Please subscribe before you dip out. And yeah, man, drop a comment. Thank you to all the likes, by the way. I don't know if these likes are going to stick around uh, come tomorrow. YouTube be doing some weird shit, but there's a lot of likes. And I appreciate you guys so much for tapping in. And just be safe out there. Whatever you do, don't text and drive. It's stupid. It's not worth it. And yeah, man, I love you guys. Appreciate all the support. And I'll see you guys next week. Cheek.